I'd like to welcome you all to the October 16th Finance and Audit Committee meeting. I'd first like to recognize we are in the traditional territory of the Standard First Nations. Our clerk to you will be Michelle Murray. Question create sign up sheet is on the desk by the computer. Just during the meeting, any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item. Would you please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet? And start a question period. I'll call you up uh, to the podium to address council. Uh, I want to uh, warn all of you that uh, the mayor's not looking for sympathy, but he has an ear infection this morning, and so we can't hear that well. So if you think you're being ignored, you probably are. <laughs> Don't take it personally. And I apologize to the audience, given the numbers, but the configuration of this room, like I said, it's my back, you it's no reflection on the importance of whatever you're here for. Uh, in that regard, uh, introduction of late items, Ms. Curry, none. And uh, before I ask for a motion for adoption of the agenda, I'm going to ask that we move up item uh, 7A to make it 4B, uh, uh, if you will, uh, so that we can just go through the discussion and not have the vote. But that will allow a number of people who are here uh, with respect to the Loudoun uh, Boathouse project to perhaps go about the rest of their day in business as opposed to sitting and waiting through the whole process this morning, if that's all right, Mr. Harding's timely and polite suggestion. And I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended, so moved by Councillor Thorpe, second by Councillor Bonner. All those in favor, motion carries, thank you very much. Uh, motion for the adoption of the minutes is circulated. Councillor Heaven, second to Councillor Markman, all those in favor, motion carries, thank you very much. Um, we would now go to Mr. Harding. And the Loudoun Park Boathouse Project, please discuss your resources. All right. Um, and before we vote on that item, there will be other councillors, I think, who uh, might have a question of Ms. Gurry. We're not going to do the vote, just so we're clear. We'll hear the presentation and then do the vote and do the reports in section. All right. Mr. Harding. Thank you, Worship. Thank you for moving this forward. And it's always, it's always a nice treat for Parks, Recreation, and Culture to be first. <laughs> so I'm a little, I'm a little not nervous. You not used to being first in this. Uh, I was going to say it would be like Washington, you know, something to the effect first in the budget, first in peace, first in the hearts of your citizens, you'd be all perfect. <laughs> I knew there'd be a good, a good comeback to that. <laughs> Your you, Worship and Council, I'm very pleased to be able to bring the, the Loud Boathouse uh, project uh, to council. It's been a long time to, to we get to this point to bring it back in front of council. I um, want to give you a little bit of background and then we have uh, uh, two groups of speakers, uh, Craig Robert, Craig Rutherford, uh, Kate Ruth Craig Rutherford, Kate Rutherford, Janice Johnson, Nancy Ford on behalf of the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society and Ed Coley and Larry Rumming from the Rotary of Manama. So just a council uh, re your reports on page uh, 54, and there's quite a bit uh, of attachments to it. Um, I just want to give, again, some background to this. And back in 2010, I believe, uh, it was one of our, our older parks, one of the parks we acquired through amalgamation in 75, is uh, what we call Loudoun, Loudoun Park. Uh, very, it's always been a very active um, uh, recreational area for the community, but particularly the last 20 years, it's also been very active for the um, rowing club and the uh, paddling uh, society. So um, in dealing with some of the aging aspects and the new increased use of the area, a number of years ago we started a, a comprehensive neighborhood plan, both for the park and the trailway. Um, and we commenced that. <coughs> a little bit of, a, just want to make sure, you, so we started back in 2006. Uh, with the conference of uh, working with the neighborhood groups, the stakeholders, and a bunch of others, um, open houses, uh, some design shreds with the community and the neighbors, um, working with the clubs and organizations, identifying how we could um, enhance this and rebuild this park to be more suited for what was happening in the community at the time. All this is attached uh, to council. Um, and, and here, so we, in 2007, we actually was uh, we adopted the, the plan, and we'll look, as we go through here, I'll show you that we came, and came back again about two years later and, and revised the plan. Um, so the, the initial plan was adopted in 2007, uh, working with the clubs and some of the some concerns in the neighborhood of where the proposed um, new building would be with um, adjacent to residents and also the impact of vegetation as well as just not working as, potentially working as well for the activities. We redid the plan and came back with another concept 
which would see the boathouse and the new washing buildings placed in a different location. We'll go through some of those, those design, those aspects. So we had a short-term implementation which, uh, plan in 2006, which we started off, which was a lot of taking out the old tennis court, which was also half storage for um, the boats. We then recreated, uh, closed off the old road, which then we were able to reestablish some of the vegetation and area and playground in the main area and create a new parking lot. And I just mentioned this to you just because we showed that we did do a plan and we actually did do some things. And then the long-term improvements, what we're, and where we're here now is um, um, some more really dealing with the infrastructure, which is the old, the old Washington building. This is a technical project from the um, Wellington Improvement um, Association. So here are some of the concepts we dealt with back back then. Um, different concepts that we considered. One was um, keeping the roads and everything the way it was, and redoing some aspects here. Keeping this the old, this, the old tennis court. Water. We're rebuilding a building out in this area, but eventually we took this concept, was the first first one done, which was to take the um, close off the road and have more open space and no vehicles going through the park area and then create a new parking lot and the transit right here. And this is what we did during phase one. After phase one, we then discussed coming back and saying, there's a lot of vegetation tree issues here, plus the, the way the, the boat house was going to be situated wasn't quite as advantageous. As well, we rebuilt, just took up the old building that we have to go at some point anyway, and built more, uh, a house, uh, boat house and new washing facilities. Over the existing footprint, there's less intrusive in the park. And so concept D is now the approved um, concept we're working with now. Over the years, and we've, it's been in the budget different times of uh, working with the clubs. Over the years, we just couldn't get to a point where there was enough momentum with the, either the, the paddlers or the rowing club and with, with us to get to a point where we could come forward with a detailed concept plan. Last year, uh, Rotary came on board with the groups and organizations looking for a legacy project, and Rotary will speak to that in a little, little bit. At the same time, though, we did come up with a final concept, which we worked through the last couple of years, of a scope size that we think is meets the, the paddling organizations and rowing clubs' needs, as well as the community needs, which we'll be upgrading if this is approved and, and done, uh, upgrading um, the public washrooms, change rooms to make them more accessible, upgraded and of course then provide the paddling aspect. So there's, it's in your plans here, this just shows a bit of a concept of the footprints. <coughs> Again, it's much more, it is a more utilitarian um, structure which meets the needs of, uh, again, the community for the swimming and, and water sports in here and also the, uh, the clubs. Again, this is conceptual which we'll use if approved to go to the design stage uh, for an RFP to go for detailed design and cost. That's my presentation with staff. If there's any questions before we ask the speakers. Thank you, Worship, through you. Um, Mr. Harding, so in that boathouse, that's what the public washrooms will be reside in that building as well. Right, so it'll be a joint project um, that will work so with the upgraded um, public washrooms, public change rooms. Those will also be utilized by the club, but they'll also have some of their own um, upstairs. Um, not, as, not as elaborate, but the majority of it will be shared washrooms and uh, change rooms. And just to follow up on that, uh, I'm just curious, sort of in terms of uh, usage over the park over the last 20 years, like, is, it, is there increasing pressure of people uh, going through there, or like, do we have any numbers in terms of, of usage? Um, they're not the actual numbers, although the clubs will show you their activities. So both clubs are very active, particularly in the summer months with um, summer programs. Um, but rowing and paddling are there all year round. Um, it is it is one of our our more heavily used swim beaches, uh, Westwood, and, and this would be would be up there in its, in its swimming areas. So very very active. Councillor Hammonds and Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Harding, um, the the financials put the total project cost at 1.35 to $2 million. Does that include upkeep of new buildings and um, maintenance, et cetera? 
No, it doesn't include the operational, and so we've, the operation we don't believe will be that much more because we're already man, managing that building year-round with custodial services. I mean, it is an older building, so we don't see a lot of increase in our in our in our maintain, ma maintenance, vandalism, cleaning. The vehicles will be similar. There may be some increased costs in just the size and scope of the building, but then again, uh, this is a. You know, it will be a 50-year-old building or will be a 50-year-old building by the time we, we do it. So um, a newer building we think will be more efficient. Uh, Thanks. We don't see a lot of increase in operation. Okay. We'll also do, a, um, with this, we'll do a similar full management agreement that we have with many other uh, groups and organizations where each tip will take a share in some of those costs. Councilor Armstrong? Um, are the feds going to stop the uh, planes after the last ones? There, or are you going to still allow them on there? That's a good question. I don't have the complete answer for that. For that one, I'd Council I'm trying to have to check on what their, their plans with that. I know there hasn't been any formal ch changes in against to the to the uh, speeds or the boat use yet on that lake. If I can comment in response to Councilor Russell Rocks, that question around use. Um, as someone who lives not far from there, I can assure you that each in the summertime is is wall to wall humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further, Mr. Harding? I think we're going to have three recommendations for council. Uh, after the delegations, I can come up and answer the questions. <coughs> Perfect. Thank you. So we next have uh, Craig Rutherford, Kate Rutherford, Janice Johnson, and Nancy Ford on behalf of the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society. <coughs> well, to your moment to start. <laughs> And if you could just introduce yourselves for the record, that would be kind. Thank you. So uh, I'm Craig Rutherford. I'm the president of the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society. With me today is Nancy Ford. She is the secretary of the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society. And we also have Kate Rutherford, who is the treasurer of the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society. She's also the president of the Nanaimo Rowing Club. Um, we also have Adrian Schroeder at the back there is the president or president of the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club, so she'll be able to answer any questions at the end if it has to do with the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club. Uh, so the society is made up of the two clubs. So there's two clubs that park call Willem Park Home. It's the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club. They were established in 1988. The Nanaimo Rowing Club was established after in 1992. Um, since basically the inception of the Nanaimo Rowing Club, because the Nanaimo Canoe Club, Kayak Club was already there, uh, both clubs have worked in cooperation with each other through uh, joint projects, working after the park together. Um, both clubs are very similar. They're obviously both water sports. Uh, both clubs are volunteer driven. Um, they serve the Mid Island area. Um, but I would say 95% of what the athletes come from the Nanaimo and Low Lansdale area. Um, we both see a great opportunity for growth with our clubs, especially in the Nanaimo area, so this is a lot of the next step for our project in that. Um, we've always wanted to have a joint facility. Uh, we had ideas going back to the uh, mid-90s and some old plans and conceptual drawings, so this, this idea has been around for a long time. Um, we're both passionate about our sports as well as being sort of important sports in the Canadian identity, with uh, rowing being Can one of Canada's most successful summer sports, and obviously the historical significance of canoe and kayak rowing in the West Coast of Canada. Um, Kate Rutherford, talk about the Nanaimo Rowing Club. Hey, just a couple of notes on our club. Um, so since we were established in uh, 1992, we've offered both youth and adult programs. Um, we've worked to provide coaching and tools for all members to reach their goals. <laughs> uh, so, uh, whether the goals are uh, high-level competitions, lifelong fitness, or recreational enjoyment. So our members range in age from 12 to 80 plus. And um, the reason we start at 12 is just basically the size of the equipment. In 80 plus, you're getting, you're getting tired. Um, we have an annual membership of between 100 and 130 members. In addition, we host an additional 
probably in the neighborhood 100 to 200 individuals from school groups, after school and summer camps, uh, discover rowing days and learn to row sessions for both the teens and adults. We operate year round, um, on and off the water. Um, most of our members start by taking a learn to row session and then join in with our regular programs. It's really amazing how, how quickly the teens catch on to the sport and, and to really the camaraderie at the club. Um, some of us adults are not quite as quick at catching on, but we do persevere. Over the last couple of years, we um, have had an increasing number of high school graduates stay in Nanaimo and they continue rowing. And we've created a program for these rowers and for VIU students. We're also working to provide adaptive rowing by adding equipment as required to adapt the boat, boats for various needs. Still some issues to address in the park for actual access to the dock. Um, the club has had great success over the years. Some of our junior rowers have competed on provincial and national teams, and many have gone on to row at a high level at various universities in Canada and the U.S. However, it isn't really about how many medals we win. It's about the feeling of being a part of an accessible, inclusive, and supportive organization. My name's Nancy Ford and I will be talking about the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club. It was established in 1988 and is a non-profit amateur sports organization that provides entry level to high performance sprint kayak and canoe training to people of all ages and all skill levels within the Nanaimo region. We currently have 22 athletes aged 9 to 20 participate as members of our youth sprint kayak team including six members who competed at the 2019 Canadian Sprint National Championships in August. Last year, 231 children and youth attended our popular summer camp program, and 381 attended paddling sessions with NCKC through school and community programs, such as the Girl Guides of Canada. 163 Vancouver Island University international students came to experience paddling sports at Long Lake. In recent years, the club has offered programs for youth with special needs. NCKC is a member of the Canucks Autism Network, and our head coach and several of our older athletes have received special Canucks Autism Network training and provide small group sessions and one-on-one -on -one instruction. NCKC is recognized by Pacific Sport as the Vancouver Island Regional Canoe Kayak Training Center. And it's also recognized by Canoe Kayak BC as the Vancouver Island Training Facility for Indigenous Canoe and Kayak Camps. We believe that recreational and competitive sports are healthy ways of building mature and responsible citizens, developing leadership skills, providing social interaction, and promoting full participation in society in our livable city. Thank you. So now that we know about the two clubs, the actual society for the boathouse is formed of the membership of those two clubs, or the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society. Uh, we were originally formed in 2015. Um, the idea behind the society is allowed a financial separation between the boathouse project and the day-to-day -day operations of the club, as it having money in an account sitting earmarked for a boathouse project seems to have a negative impact on gaming grants and other bursary options. Um, so the purpose of the society is to develop, maintain, and operate facilities to support the training and operational needs of rowing and paddling sports on Long Lake, as well as to promote rowing and paddling sports in the central Vancouver Island area. Uh, so our current structures was, as Richard said, originally built in 1967 as a centennial project. Um, when it was first built, it consisted of a public washroom and a covered picnic area. Uh, the covered picnic area was then renovated to become the home of the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club. And when the Nanaimo Rowing Club was formed, an ATCO trailer, which are those red doors you see on the far side, was added on for the home of the Nanaimo Rowing Club in 1992 and that has been the state of our facilities pretty much since then. Um, 
As you can see, the building is aging. Um, it's taken some wear and tear over the years. Um, been painted over many, many times to cover graffiti. Um, as you can see, the building's not large and the boats are quite big. So our current storage facilities are a chain link compound in the park. Um, it's quite cramped. Uh, we have a lot of equipment as both clubs are sharing the area crammed in there as the programs have grown over the years. Um, the current buildings we have, as you can see, is quite cramped when we're trying to do indoor workouts, especially when the winter months hit. Um, this has forced us to sort of adapt, so we do a lot of work outside. <coughs> we take over the public sidewalks quite often. Um, oh, don't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> I only hope there's a couple people aren't listening this morning. <laughs> Click through that one real quick. Um, due to the size of the summer camps, uh, the Nanamo Canoe and Kayak Club's uh, forced to set up a tent to house all the kids that attend that to keep all their stuff dry. Um, as you would imagine, it is not the most secure storage. Um, the park itself is not necessarily set up to get our, all our equipment to and from the water. There are a few hazards, uh, especially with some storms over the year, there's some deadfall. Um, so as you can see with the rolling shells especially, we are as of right now, dodging through trees to get our boats up and down from the water. Um, so the rolling shell you see there is costs about twenty-four thousand dollars to replace. So if we take the end off of the tree, it does hurt a little bit. Um, we also have to share all of our workout space with any sort of valuable equipment that we don't want stolen. So we're storing our coach boats and outboard engines inside our workout facilities. As you can see, this makes for a pretty tight squeeze. Uh, outside, as you can see, it's all uncovered. Um, this makes us susceptible to things such as fallen trees, which has happened several times over the years. Uh, if you look, a tree branch came down and took the end off of one of our eights, which is about a $40,000 boat. So that was, that was only about $10,000 to get it repaired. Um, as you can see, just by having the boats stored outside, it's a huge cost to the day-to-day -day operations because we always have to account for things like this, this happening. Um, we've also been susceptible to do several break-ins over the last couple of years. Uh, the Nanaimo Rolling Club has had three outboard engines stolen. The Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club had two outboard in three outboard engines as well, and then another 13 kayaks stolen. So that's been our big challenge in the last two or three years. Um, as well, the current washrooms, they have been updated since this picture was taken. They are heated and open year-round as well, but as you can see, they're uh, older design. Uh, a lot of the kids don't like to change in the public space, so a lot of the time the bathroom stalls are taken up by kids that are changing rather than being used as a bathroom stall. Um, where our dock is currently situated is through a gravel playground and then a dirt path. Um, as we develop our para program, it is a bit of a problem. Uh, as of right now, the couple of para athletes we do have have managed to make it to and from the dock, but it, it does add an added barrier to get them into sport, which we would like to see not happen. So the next phase in the revitalization of Long Lake Park has been developed and, develop and build the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center. Um, so we've, the society as well as the city have uh, worked with architects to develop some conceptual plans. I'll go through this quickly as Richard has sort of shown all this, but so you saw that one. Um, so this is just a look, better look at where the boathouse would be situated in the park uh, over top of the existing building. Uh, as you can see down here where existing boat storage is will be gone with the new boathouse. That'll open the park up to more multi-use rather than the two clubs sort of taking up both sides of the park. Um, just look at the floor plan, uh, so there's the defined clubhouse area, which is at the bottom here. This would be the actual, the finished areas, which would have the bathrooms, even the heat, which would be a nice upgrade. Um, now there'll be the boat storage area, which is basically just a warehouse style building. We'll, we'd look at something like a compacted dirt floor, very basic, unheated if we can pull it off, just as cheaply as possible, just to put a roof over the equipment. So some of the projects 
project benefits that we see include the continued existence of the two clubs as active providers of recreational opportunities for the community by having the facilities needed to provide a quality experience and increased access to the documented health benefits of rowing and paddling and increased year-round programming to promote a healthy lifestyle both on and off the water. We are looking at increasing our programming through the ability to operate year-round through the cold, damp winter months, improving the universal access for all of our users, increased security to reduce theft and vandalism of our uh, equipment as we are nonprofit societies, and it really cuts into our operating budgets and volunteer hours to uh, raise money to buy equipment that has been vandalized or stolen. Uh, it develops a sense of community to, to attract and retain members, expanded secure waterproof, weatherproof storage, and it provides a focal location to bring like-minded people together in our city. <coughs> And we want to enhance programming for youth. Youth is a big focus of our programs, and we can increase the school, club, and other community groups' use of our space. We could have a safe, inviting, and comfortable space for people to get together, a sense of community and belonging, and the quality and safety of our programs. So in terms of benefit to the entire city, uh, the new facility would allow us to host more competitive events. Right now, we both the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club and the Nanaimo Rowing Club host what's considered very small events. Um, the new society would allow us to, or building would allow us to expand into multi-day events, which would bring a larger economic benefit to Nanaimo. Uh, more people coming in, more hotel stays. There's no real other nearby clubs, so people will be coming up from Victoria, so they'll be spending the whole weekend in town. Um, in terms of looking after our equipment lowering costs, it'll allow us to keep our equipment on level racks, stable ground, so it's just that much easier to get things in and out. We'll just reduce those little damages from bouncing off the trees, bouncing off the racks, bouncing off the other boats, um, as well as it'll provide access to warm, dry facilities during inclement weather, not only for the rowing and paddlers, but for members of society that are in the area. They'll actually have a, a heated bathroom, hopefully, to go into. Um, as well as we can add supports to the community through that. Um, also, the new boathouse should lock a lot better than the current facility, so it'll enhance the aesthetics of the park. Um, we're hoping there can be a sense of pride for the community that we, we have this facility for rowing and paddling in Nanaimo, and we're very successful at those sports. Um, they'll also have increased security. Um, we're hoping it'll also allow an increased present for the presence for the clubs in the park, which will sort of help keep an eye on all the activities that go on the evenings and weekends at the park. Um, also improved washroom and change room facilities for, as uh, the mayor said, the wall of humanity that is down there in the summer. Uh, the, the, two, the small men's and the small women's change room uh, doesn't quite seem big enough most of the time. You go in there and there's 10 or 15 people in there. Um, we also have accessible docks and paths for, for all users of the park. Um, they're also, by amalgamating the rowing club and paddling club spaces. It'll allow more space for playground enhancements, enhanced picnic areas, and looking after city equipment. Right now, the city staff has a very small beam closet. They do all their custodial work, which is fabulous. We want them for it. So a little bit about um, funding opportunities. So uh, while we feel that we have a solid conceptual plan for, the, for a new boathouse, uh, what we're seeking is a solid final design and cost estimate. And that way we'll be able to put together a, uh, materials for a capital fundraising campaign. Um, without those numbers, we're sort of going, okay, we, we want money for a boathouse. Um, so we're really excited to be partnering with Rotary Club of Nanaimo North and um, in them choosing the boathouse as a leg their legacy project. Um, so with them, we'll be undertaking some joint fundraising to bring this legacy to completion. In addition, our campaign will be looking at grassroots fundraising, the usual raffles and uh, beer and burgers and silent auctions, an alumni and member gift-giving campaign, 
and seeking corporate sponsorships and partnerships with all levels of government. We are already set up to provide tax, re tax receipts through the BC Amateur Sport Fund, which some of you would have known as the uh, National Sport Trust Fund. They've just recently renamed. Um, there's also some options possibly uh, for para funding to um, increase accessibility. Um, other less certain um, sources of funding which we will pursue whenever available are things like the Provincial Capital um, Project Gaming Grants. Um, they were offered for the last three years and the hope is that they will continue that program in the future. Um, um, even less certain are some vote-based grants offered by organizations like Craft or Aviva Insurance. And we were lucky enough to get $25,000 from the Craft Celebration Tour a number of years ago and that money has been put away. Um, so for these types of grants it's something we would need to get the whole community on side with. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's others. Um, there's things like the Nanaimo Foundation, Vancouver Foundation, and we will be pursuing that. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thanks very much. Uh, Councillors Martman, Art Emmons, and Armstrong. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, folks, I'll hand go up. So Maybe it's not just my hearing that's going. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. This is awesome information. And I'm wondering, so the increase you were talking about, um, how the numbers have increased. In total, do you have any idea of number of people using? Using the park? Using your, you've mentioned different groups, yeah. but I'm wondering if you just have a, an average. Of I, I'm guessing the the going over would be around 350 users annually. And the canoe kayaks around 900. Okay, thank you. Councilor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question for the delegation and one for staff. Um, do you have a fundraising goal? Um, part of that remains to be seen with the final cost of the building, um, but we're yeah, easily in the hundreds of thousands. Great. And to Mr. Harding, if I may, um, the delegation suggested that this will be um, a really great asset for the Mid-Island. There isn't one uh, north of Victoria. Parking will be an issue for multi-day events, so how do we anticipate managing that? <coughs> Love having parking problems. It means we've done something yeah. right. <laughs> it's a tiny parking lot for a multi-day event with people coming from all over the island. So realistically, how do we move people in and out? The only answer I get back on it is it's sort of McPhail. No, McPhail's got 194 stalls, and we have you know, 30,000 people down there. It's one of those things you have to manage, with either with shoveling or busing or, or parking locations with the malls. Relatively close by, maybe there's some partnerships with the team with those types of things. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Much appreciated. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Foley and Mr. Running from the Rotary Club of the Nivo North. Okay, Your Worship, Councillors, staff, thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name's Ed Poley, I'm the Treasurer of the Rotary Club of Nanaimo North, and here today we have uh, Barney Sharp, our Club President, Jeff Tomlinson, the Chair of our Fundraising Committee, and Larry Rummy, who's our uh, Membership uh, Chair and Club Historian. He's the brains of the outfit, and he'll be able to talk about <laughs> So the Rotary Club of the North was chartered in 1972 and has been proudly serving the community since that time. We're also a registered BC society. We've supported numerous Nanaimo organizations including School District 68, BIU, Nanaimo Youth Services, the Boys and Girls Club, the Lowe's and Fishes Food Bank, Nanaimo Food Share, Haven House and countless others. During our time of service we've contributed well over a million dollars to the community. Some of our donations include $285,000 for Bastion Restoration from 1989 to 91, 
5,000 annually for scholarships for high school students, uh, 2,000 annually for bursaries for PI student, PIU students, uh, $20,000 plus over the past five years for the boys and girls, big brothers, big sisters, uh, in school mentoring program, 20,000 plus over the past five years for the Nanaimo Food Chairs summer lunch, summer lunch munch program, 42,000 to heart and stroke for education and research, $10,000 for a van conversion for the handicapped, uh, $11,700 for the fire safety house, $10,000 each for the Nanaimo Museum, the VIU Library, and the Rotary Field House, $8,000 for a Bevan Park Equestrian Center, $15,000 for the Rotary Fields at VIU, plus countless other small donations here and there over time. So we're a club that likes our service to go beyond financial donations. So we work together to provide service, hands-on service, in a number of ways. We deliver a monthly community breakfast on the second Saturday of every month out of the... Uh, we provide, cook, and serve the food there for, uh, for the community out of the new, the new Hope Center. Uh, we cook, serve, uh, and we're... Uh, we're right here. Okay, we sort food at the uh, Loaves and Fishes Food Bank uh, warehouse on the fourth uh, Tuesday of every month. We, pro we uh, provide uh, and serve barbecued food and popcorn for the uh, Parks and Rec family uh, fishing day and for the year-end family fun day. We bartend and uh, manage the bar for the Dragon Boat beer gardens and dinners. In the past, we painted the hospice house and we assisted Nanaimo Youth Services with the uh, restoration of the White House. <coughs> We're here today to support the Loudon, the Parks and Rec request for the Loudon Park for the funding for the design phase of the Loudon Park Boathouse project. It's our club's 50th anniversary in 2022, and we'd like to commemorate that with a permanent addition to the community. And we've chosen to support this project for a number of very good reasons. It will result in a significant improvement in Nanaimo's recreational infrastructure, and it'll for us it will provide lasting visible evidence of our contribution to the community. It represents the opportunity for our club to begin an ongoing and productive partnership with two excellent organizations nationally recognized that provide first-class youth programs. It represents the opportunity for our club to continue its, its relationship with Parks and Recreation in the City of Nanaimo to enhance that relationship. And for us as a club, it'll provide our club with a strong connection to a city park that'll become the focus, can become the focus for a lot of our service activities, landscaping, barbecues, community events, the opportunity to partner with the, with the clubs in uh, events and competitions and that kind of stuff. Uh, we found through our community breakfast, for example, that community engagement and working together is a really good thing for the health of our club. That's where our new members come from. So the idea of this ongoing partnership is exciting for us. So if the project continues, we will commit to provide $100,000 as a direct donation from our club. And we'll work with both uh, on our own and with Parks and Rec and with the other clubs and for grants, uh, corporate sponsorship, fundraising, that kind of stuff. And we bring the Rotary brand out okay. here. Rotary is the oldest and longest serving service club in the world. It's been around for 114 years. It has an impeccable reputation for financial stewardship and quality of service, and it will add something significant, we feel, to any funding or sponsorship or grant request. So that's it, and I really hope that uh, you guys will decide to support that project. I think it's, uh, it will serve us all well. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Martin. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Foley. I'm wondering that 100,000 um, funding, is that towards the building of it itself or towards the beginning of the conceptual design? Or? Well, we've, the, as I said, we've, we've got about 20, we've, we've started, again, we formed the same thing. We formed a, a separate society to be able to, to house the money specifically for this project. We've got about 26,000 so far towards the 100. we made a commitment to Parks and Rec that uh, if, the, if there's, the approval is here to proceed with that. We'll contribute 10,000 of that up front to the, uh, the design phase of okay. the project. I believe the, the Flatwater Training Society has agreed to provide money to that. So we'll have skin in the game from the outset. 
Perfect. Thank you. And uh, I'm confident that with, with our brand, with the work, and it's an easy story to tell. There's all kinds of corporate foundations that, you know, you're talking about youth, you're talking about, you know, disabled participation, that kind of stuff. I think with, with working together, we'll be able to make a significant contribution to the funding of this project. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Foley, thank you for a very compelling presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Harding. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you for your presentations also. Um, as you see, it's been a long time coming to get this back in front of Council. Um, again, the, we've given the Council three uh, recommendations. Through the whole group, do you have any question on it? Um, as the, both organizations mentioned, one of the stumbling blocks is not having a detailed design and costing um, for this kind of project. Once we have that in place, it's an easier way to go for other funding sources. So one of the things we're asking Council is to consider the 123750 during the 2020 financial plan review for de uh, detailed design and costing for Loudon Boathouse, and of which said 15000 is coming from private contributions and from Rotary 5 from the flat water. And then direct staff to return uh, next year if, this, if, that's, if it is approved, um, and, to, and we do the uh, design details. Final costs and funding options for Council's review and consideration during the 2021 budget review if design phase is approved, and direct staff to work with the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society and Rotary Club in Nanaimo North on fundraising and other sources of revenue for the project. Thank you. I'm in Council, Council Hartman. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to just comment on the cost of this project. Was there any money, I was trying to read through all the details, was there any money that's being put aside already for this project? Oh, over the years, when, when the concept plan was adopted in uh, 20, 2007, we initially put in about $900,000, 300 from the city, 600 from uh, the private groups. And as I mentioned, as we never could really get traction on, a, on, a, on the actual scope and size of a building. So we were always going back and forth, and the four clubs, we've worked on a number of different options, everything from redesigning just a, a small storage building where they're building, where they're our equipment is now back to a much more elaborate kind of uh, structure. The last couple of years, we've just been able to focus specifically on, um, as they've mentioned in their presentation, what they really just need to keep um, the programs going and equipment safe, athletes warm, and, and users warm. So we've had it in, we've always kept pushing it out, pushing it out. And so the long answer to a short question is no, we don't have it in the budget right now. So, But it was something we kept looking at they over the years. used over the years? Just, we just kept moved it out. We moved it over past the five-year capital, so it was always there earmarked in there, but we just kept moving it out. Okay, thank you. Councillor Truly, then Councillor Evans. <coughs> yes, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, Mr. Hardy. So I just want to clarify the, the amount of money that we're actually voting on. Is it the total is $123,750 minus $15,000, or, or is it $123,000, period? The, the it's hundred twenty three thousand for the design, and so it'd be um, minus that that amount. So hundred eight hundred eight thousand. Yep. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hammonds. Thank you for you, Mr. Harding. Um, obviously, there's capacity issues and and a lot of community energy around this, and um, I see its need. And I'm curious, the phrasing around a, a facility being at the end of its life. Does that mean? You know, two years, three years, five years. We keep kind of patching it up. Like, what, what is the option if, what does it look like um, in the future if this building is replaced? It's, it's it's the continuation of just just patching it and re-roofing it, like we've done over the years. Uh, we did do some work about five years ago to add some heat and closed it off so they could use it because um, we were actually bringing portables in at some point because it was um, uh, it's going to keep the plumbing going there. So it is heated now, but again, that, uh, it's, it's just, it's, it doesn't, it, the size of it, the age of it, it's just, it's just an older, older structure. But we would, if it wasn't, if it wasn't approved, we'd continue to just go along with it. Councilor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Mr. you to Ms. Hari. Um, do we have any idea on the amount of funding uh, the various clubs are going to be able to, to provide for this? Like, is it 50% and then we start for the, um, construction? Um, 
So that's <coughs> worship to Council Bond. That's why we gave you option number two uh, for considerations. Once we do the design and we can, and we know exactly what we're dealing with, um, we can come back with you with more details on that. Also, when you do have a, um, a shovel ready project, is then it's much easier to go for different grant options that may come up yeah. uh, for, for infrastructure. Um, and so if you have something that's ready to go, we know that um, we have clubs and organizations that are also willing to vote and apply for some of those grants too that maybe you can apply for. So it's a, we don't know that yet. Council can set that phase if you want when we come back. You can, you can put a percentage in if you want. We t I tend to keep it open and see what we can come back with. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. We haven't given them any specific form. Well, I, I thank you for that. I mean, I, I like the con I like the concept, and, and I like the idea of having something shovel ready. So, to me, that makes this a good investment in the event that we would come down the line. I'm just I, I'm concerned that if if funding is only able to be if it comes in at say two million dollars, and, and and funding is only available of two hundred thousand, that means if we we're we'd be on the hook for uh, one point eight million. Um, so. Um, it's those are just variables we don't know yet, but I'm quite happy with giving getting something that's shell ready in the event that the grants do come available. Your Worship, if I could uh, just add a little bit to that for Council Bonner and, and Council. So what we've done with other other projects like this over time is uh, we'll set a we'll set a goal. We do actually with the partners in park. We do it just well, yearly. We do it yearly uh, that you'll offer some funding for our neighborhood park, uh, but those that project won't proceed until that group has, has secured what they've agreed to secure. So, and we do that with other other projects um, as well. So, um, if we have it in place, it's ready to go. There's some funding available. Um, the groups can can make make those funding um, goals. Then it will proceed. If not, council can determine no. We're gonna have to delay it until such funding is secured. Councilor okay, Thurr, thank you, Your Worship. Um, bearing in mind there's no there's no motion on the floor, and I'm not going to make one at this point. Uh, but Mr. Harding has sort of confused me now by yes. referencing option number two. Yes, so Your Worship, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's, I was trying to get your attention to clarify that. Mr. Harding said option two, what he's meaning is number two and option one. So oh. the recommendation that's in the report, number two is what he's referring to. Thank you, that clarifies it. My apologies. Sorry. No further questions for Mr. Harding. Um, I had suggested that uh, we could have the vote uh, in the appropriate uh, section under reports, or uh, is there interest in having the vote now? I mean, your hands. No. Now. I'd be fine with now. I'd probably stick around to vote anyways. All right. Uh, there, would someone care to uh, to make the recommended motion? I'll make a motion <coughs> that the Finance and Audit Committee recommend that Council consider funding of 123750 during the 2020 Financial Plan Review for detailed design and costing of the Loudon Boat House, with 15000 coming from private contributions. Uh, but not the other two items, direct staff securing funding and costing and... Oh, are, are, they're all together? Okay. That's and direct staff to return with final. No, because that could so. Um, so, Your Worship, just for clarification, all three are one recommendation that could be moved together. However, if Council chooses, they can vote on it. It's your motion, Councilor Martin. Oh, I, I will continue with number two direct staff to return with the final costing and funding option for Council's review and consideration during the 2021 budget review if the design phase is approved, and direct staff to work with the Long Lake Flatwater Training Center Society, and Rotary Club of Nanaimo North, and fundraising and other sources of revenue for the project. Second. Second, Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Mr. Harding. Just wanted to make sure Council realizes that you're really just, if you approve these, you're getting them into your budget deliberations. It's, you're not approving it, you're just approving it to get into your budget deliberations. Perfect. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Speaking to the, uh, the motion, and in the interest of openness, I just want to uh, ask uh, staff a question. Uh, first of all, declaring that uh, myself and Councillor Turley and Councillor Brown are members of the Rotary Club of Nanaimo North. So although I certainly support this uh, project, uh, I want to make sure 
that I am not, or we are not, in a conflict of interest by voting on this. Can I, can I get your uh, expert opinion, Ms. Gurry? Um, so thank you, Worship, through you to Councillor Bork. Unfortunately, I can't ensure mm -hmm. that you're not in a conflict. What I can do is um, let you know that it's, it's up to you to determine um, whether you are or are not. However, if you are not board members of the Rotary Club, and you're not the directing mind um, behind the decision making or direction provided by the club that you're a member of. Um, you would not therefore have a fiduciary or a pecuniary um, duty or interest with the Rotary Club. Um, however, there is personal pecuniary and perception. Um, however, as you're not the directing mind behind the decisions there, um, really, it's 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 up to you. There is case law around being members of a board um, that are um, actually directors of board directors, etc. Um, however, just being members, there is no law around that that really lets you know. So it's it's um, up to you to determine whether you feel you are. Councilor Thorne. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, thank you to Ms. Gurry for that. Uh, so, just to clarify, I am not on the board of the uh, Rotary Club of Nanaimo North. I'm certainly not the directing mind behind the <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's just the wrong I didn't know that. But, uh, so, I appreciate the advice. I am going to state publicly that I do not feel I am in a conflict in this situation as simply one of many members of the club that are uh, willing to raise money to support this project uh, and we've heard of the good work that Rotary does and I'm very proud of that and uh, so I will um, I will vote on this issue and I will be pleased to support Rotary and to support this project and if I may just uh, while I have the floor uh, point out uh, that one of the reasons I support it is that this project has been in some form on the books as Mr. Harding has said, since 2007. It's not jumping the queue. This is long overdue. This building is in a sad state of repair, despite the city's best efforts to keep it upgraded. Uh, built in 1967, which is a long time ago. It's so long ago, that was the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the stand. <laughs> It's, it's, it's due for a change. Um, so to me, this is just an opportunity to achieve something that the city uh, needs to achieve with some good, solid financial partners with the uh, Flatwater people and the Rotary Club. So, so I will be voting and I will support the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Thor. Before I go to Councillor Turley, given the mention of his uh, membership in the Rotary Club and Council Gessebrock is anxious to say something, I, I, I might say, given the Given a, uh, an unretained free legal opinion this morning, I think it would be quite a stretch to find someone in a conflict of law organization wants to give the public money uh, and that that would somehow place you in a, in a conflict. But uh, having said that, Councillor Turley and Councillor Gesselbrock. Yeah, thank you, Worship. I, I too agree with uh, Councillor Thorpe. I, I thought long and hard about this because I you know when there's a being conflict, I, I, I take that seriously. However, given the fact that, A, I'm not going to get any financial reward out of this, uh, nor is the Rotary Club going to get financial reward out of it. In fact, it could be a hell of a lot of work and, and stress and everything else. So I, I, I'm having a tough time believing that I'm placing myself in, in, a, in a issue of conflict. So I, I too, will be voting. Okay. Your Worship, just to, just, to, just to clarify that, I just want to be clear that it's not just pecuniary. No. Uh, Councillor Gesselbrock and Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about this project. Uh, any opportunity to facilitate getting our youth and community out active is a, is a great thing. Um, I do go there often and see the state of the facilities, and you know, good on the, uh, the, the clubs for getting out there and making best use of a meager situation there um, and also just the spirit of collaboration with the Rotary Club and the two clubs working together I think that this is really in line with how we want to do business and so I'm excited to uh, support this project uh, that being said uh, there's a lot of demands on, on, on the city uh, budget and uh, financing things and so 
however much money that we can uh, raise uh, outside of uh, the city, uh, it was greatly appreciated. So I look forward to the hard collaborative work uh, to get to that point. And I think having a design set and ready to go, shovel ready, is uh, a critical step. So I'll be definitely supporting this next next step in the process. Councilor Armstrong. Yeah, I too will be supporting it. We've had very little city investment in uh, the actually central north period, or the any period throughout the years. So. It's time that we put some money in, in those parts of town instead of always the south. So definitely. <laughs> well, it's most of the coast from the city south, so it's, it's a true fact. Look at it. So I'll definitely be supporting. That's a road. That's not a sports stuff. And most people don't support it. <laughs> we'll get to this. Ms. Curry, um, by minding fog, says we did get a seconder, didn't we? Yes, we yes. Did. yes. I thought we had it, to be sure. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is Ms. Mercer. Finance and Audit Committee on September 18th, the committee indicated that they wanted more information about the projects that are in our current project plan. So to that end, we've created a presentation that uh, highlights a number of projects from various departments um, and uh, that highlights some of the projects that they are doing. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. It just highlights or it represents some of the larger dollar projects or some higher profile projects for council information. So a little bit about the project plan. The plan classifies projects as operating or capital based on our capital expenditure policy and that's really more of an accounting issue than it is for um, you to consider. Um, the plan, the plan that we're presenting is the first five years of our 10 year project plan. And the project plan is informed by the city's asset management and 20-year infrastructure plans. So the plan identifies budgets relating to completing infrastructure renewal, increased infrastructure capacity due to growth, and implementation of council's strategic priorities. So a little bit about the timeline, just what we've done and what's coming up. So from February to May, and these, this is the timeline related to the project plan. There's many other aspects involving operational budgets. But from February to May, the 10-year project plans for the upcoming budget cycle are updated. So the financial planning department works with um, the various departments to update all of their, their project plans. In June, we target to have a draft 10-year project plan completed. And from July, August into September, financial planning works to fund the completed draft project plan. And in September um, and October, project plan is, re is reviewed by senior management. And that's an opportunity, if we have some funding issues, we have an opportunity to move things around to make everything work. Um, so that's kind of where we're at today. Going forward in November, November 20th and 22nd, we will be presenting the 2020 department business plans to you all. And October, uh, November 25th, we will present um, the 2020-2024 project plan highlights. And then in December, so December 2nd, we have our public uh, consultation, which is the E-Town Hall meeting. And we also have some time that day scheduled if we need it for a budget day. 
Um, and it's all. Sorry, thank you, Worship. Mercer, um, I, I just missed that first date of the uh, business plan. Uh, 20, 20. The 20th. Of November 20th, 20th and 24th. And 22nd, then, sorry. 20th and 22nd. Okay, perfect. Wednesday and Friday. <clears throat> and assuming everything goes perfectly, we will have a 2020-2024 financial plan bylaw for you to um, for first three readings on December 16th with adoption in January 2020. And just some final thoughts before I hand it over to Ms. Fulla. Um, for your information, currently we're looking at a similar tax increase to 2019. Um, we're still waiting for some final numbers relating to um, benefits and growth, etc. So we can't give you a final number at this point. Um, but I would like to like the committee to keep that in mind when you are considering adding additional things to the plan um, as it could affect the tax increase if funding is needed from general taxation. Um, just a bit on reserves. Um, while they look flush. Uh, Councillors. Oh. And then no, Bonner. I was just pointing. Oh, sorry. Thank you, uh, thank you Your Worship. Um, question is, Mr. Sir. Um, would that include us moving projects around? Like to say we want to bring forward projects forward and delay projects? That's more it could. There's a funding issues, like the funding of the projects is a little bit of a struggle sometimes to, it's like Jenga, you play, you know, you fund things um, in, a, in a certain order. So it could, um, what we generally try to do is move things around. So anything that affects general taxation, we use that money first. We and then go to reserves if necessary. It depends on what level of the reserves are at, at, at any given year. And that's what Ms. Fulla does in the summer is figures out how we can fund everything that the city needs to do. So it's possible, um, but we would have to go away and see what we can move around. I believe that was quite a problem in this one. <laughs> it, is a, it, it is a balancing act to figure out where all of the pieces fit together and and the timing and staff resources as well. That's another component to that as well. Um, with regards to reserves, while they look flush, um, <clears throat> the vast majority is accounted for by plans or uh, regulation. So DCC um, reserve money, we're very limited as to what we can spend that on. So we're um, restricted on that. But there are some reserves that have um, unaccounted for funds in there and um, but again, these are limited. And so Ms. Fuller will go over this in more detail in a few minutes, but I just wanted to point that out before we start. So I will pass it over to Ms. Fuller now to go over some high level finance highlights, and then we will pass it on to the individual departments to go through their budgets. Thank you, Ms. Mercer. Ms. Fuller. Good morning, Mayor and Council. So as Ms. Mercer said, I just want to run through some of the highlights of the financial plan before we turn it over to staff to highlight for you some of the projects that are in the five years of the plan. So looking at our plan, we have $291 million over the next five years. So this is investment in infrastructure, this is strategic projects, as well as plans and studies. So the two biggest areas that we're going to be investing in are transportation infrastructure. So about 23% of that budget over the next five years, or $67 million, is going to go into transportation infrastructure. And 20% is going to go into water infrastructure, or about $60 million. So those are our two biggest areas where we're having this plan. The other things that I wanted to point out is you can see that Parks has a pretty big orange block there in a few years and I just want to make that connection to for you that that is the waterfront walkway. The waterfront walkway is considered a trail so it does fall under our Parks infrastructure and we have about 30 million dollars in the next five years for the phased development of the waterfront walkway. So overall, parks infrastructure is about $39 million. 30 of that is tied to the waterfront walkway. Councillor Kesselbar. Thank you, Worship. Um, yes, well, I'm just curious, uh, oh, oh, the, the, the Bevan Park roof, what, what year what years were that in? I believe the Bevan Park roof right. next phase is 2020, correct, Mr. Hart? It's over, it is 2021 and 2022. Okay. Um, when we look at... 2024. Sorry. 
Yeah, when we look at facilities, we have about 32 million over five years. We have to remember about 13.4 million of that is tied to the fire station and the one replacement because that is a multi-year project. And we still have another 13.4 million coming up in the budget for that project. Uh, the other thing that I'm sure Mr. Harding or Mr. Boot will address when they're up here talking about facilities is the condition assessment program that we have underway that we have that grant funding for. That is going to bring to light what the state of our facilities is in, and we are anticipating in future years we are going to have to invest more money in our facilities because we're going to find out that a lot of them are aging and engineering and to light on certain components. So if you want to maintain level of service, we will probably need to invest more in our facilities in the future. So, some other highlights in your agenda. So you do have a copy of the. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, that was me. Thank you for uh, that identification of the waterfront walkway. I was curious about that bump. I'm curious about the little asterisks at the bottom. Presentation does not include changes as a result of the business cases being added. So, what you're saying is that we have a tax increase that's comparable to last year, but we haven't yet embedded any of the business cases that we could approve. Through the chair to Councillor Hammond. Uh, so this presentation was prepared when we were still working on the preliminary project plan. Since that time, a senior leadership team has met. They have made recommendations for business cases to be included in the draft financial plan, and we are currently preparing that draft financial plan documentation that you will get in November. So the property tax increase that we're talking about is the property tax increase related to the draft financial plan and it has business cases included. So we didn't want to cause any confusion that we present here projects and then you get your grant budget, but can you go, the numbers don't match, like how do they not match we just had a presentation two weeks ago. Uh, this presentation was prepared for before um, those business cases were added. Okay, thank you. So some other highlights, you have your project book in your agenda, which provides a fair bit of detail about the different types of projects, different types of assets that we're building, if they're new, renewal, that sort of thing. Just a few highlights. When we look at our transportation infrastructure, we're looking at about $15 million in road rehab over the next five years. We have about $19 million for new cycling and pedestrian amenities. There's about $14 million for renewing existing equipment and vehicle renewals. We also have an investment in water distribution and supply mains of about $42.5 million, as well as drainage mains, renewals, and upgrades of $22 million. So you can see that we have a lot of different projects going on. The other thing that we thought might be of interest to is to talk about how the projects break down between the different types of projects we do. So of course we do renewal projects, we do new projects, we do strategic projects. So we had a look at our 2020 project plan, and here we're just looking at the general plan. So we're not looking at sewer and water projects, we're just focused on general. So as you can see from here, about 34% of the projects we do are concurrent projects. So just to remind Council what a concurrent project is, this is where we're doing more than one infrastructure at the same time in the project, or we might be doing different types of transportation infrastructure at the same time. So for example, we might be digging up the road and we're going to replace the drainage line and the water main at the same time, because it's more cost effective to dig up the road once and do the work. Or we might have a transportation project where we're rehabbing the road, and while we're doing that, we're going to add a cycling lane and maybe we're going to add some pedestrian amenities such as the sidewalk. So you will see over the years we are doing more and more concurrent projects where the engineering staff always looks at all the utilities around and we look what we can bundle together to make an effective and efficient project. Overall in the project plan you're going to see that about 63% of our projects are actually manual projects. So this is infrastructure that is end of life and these projects need to be done to maintain existing service levels. Only about 5% of our projects are strategic projects. So that's things like our public works day, our OCP update, our invasive plant management program. So these are strategic undertakings that we do. And the rest is mainly... Councillor Bonner. Sorry to interrupt again. Thank you, Chair. For you to, uh, it's full up. So with concurrent projects, um, do we generate more of a loss by pulling the pipes out of the ground that may not be necessarily ready to be pulled out, but it's good because they're doing the work at the same time? Does that generate more of a loss on our budget? I'm not necessarily saying but we generally don't pull out pipes that are, still have a lot of work left in them. Thank you, Ms. Cole. You're Worship, I think this is a really good question, and I think that's something we're, we're sensitive to because there's, there's always a there's always a balance, and it's always hard to predict the exact day that the pipe is going to fail. You, you can never pick, pick it perfectly. But we use age, we use 
we actually do a visual inspection to check to see if things like a video inspection within the bike to see the condition of it, return an assessment, and then determine whether it needs to be ripped out. Of course, we wouldn't replace a bike for its time just because it's 72 years old, as an example. Um, so it's it's always one of those considerations it's, as the, the concept pro project is put together and then we move forward into the design, and that's when a lot of the detailed work gets done, like the, the video inspection. So. <coughs> Mr. Well, I think you're going to get a lot of questions this morning, so <laughs> it reflects the quality of your presentation, which is a compliment. So, moving on to how are we going to fund all those projects? Well, you can see about just under 14% comes from general revenue, so that's property taxes. The balance is made up of debt, reserves, and private contributions and grants. So you can see from here, the circle here, that a lot of the funding comes from reserves to fund projects. One of the other things you're going to notice if you compare this to, say, the chart that we have this year the financial plan, is the general reserves, the percentage has gone way down, and stat reserves has gone way up. So the 2020-2024 financial plan reflects the new reserve policy that you have adopted, but doesn't come into effect until January 1st. So there's quite a few reserves that we use for funding projects, such as the IT reserve, the copier reserve, the parking reserve, the strategic infrastructure reserve, and those are all currently general reserves. As of January 1st, they come special <coughs> reserve. So that's why you see that big shift if you compare this to a previous sphere. It's just that those the status of those reserves has shifted over to statutory reserves. So it looks like we're funding more from statutory reserves, but it's just the classification of the reserve. Councillor uh, Brown. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I'm just curious, what does that 0.8% for grants and private contributions work out to in dollar amount? Uh, so we have a $195,000 uh, for developers that is going towards the Mary Ellen project. I'm not sure if Engineering and Public Works will be speaking about that one. We also have $150,000 from UBCM that's tied to that condition assessment program that we talked about. That's a multi year project that we got a grant for. And then we also have a hundred thousand for the flood inundation study. So that's where we got the two hundred thousand dollars earlier this year. Hundred thousand is in twenty nineteen, and hundred thousand is in twenty twenty. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the debt, so everyone understands what is included in the debt. So of course we have the additional boring we still have to do for fire station number one. We have the waterfront walkway. <coughs> Pretty well, most of the waterfront walkway will be funded by debt. We also have another automated garbage truck in 2022, so we're doing short-term equipment borrowing for that project. And then we also have two sewer GCC projects. Can we talk about this a bit last year during the budget cycle? We're not collecting our sewer GCCs fast enough, so we don't have enough money in our sewer GCCs to fund the projects that we need to do for growth to continue. Uh, so right now we're looking at funding two projects through borrowing. One would be internal borrowing, and the second one would be external borrowing. We don't have capacity to do internal borrowing for more projects. And of course, the debt repayment, hopefully someday we'll be repaid through sewer DCCs, but at this point we are repaying it through sewer reserves, because as I said, they're just not generating enough sewer DCC revenue for all the projects and to support the debt repayment. Can you, can you make that real for me? Um, so perhaps the sub subdivision's going in somewhere, they've done all their work, they've completed the subdivision, but the, they're, they're tying it into a pipe, I take it, that isn't adequate. Is that the kind of situation you're talking about and the DCCs aren't sufficient to fund? Or just give me a practical example, I just want to understand how it works. So, Your Worship, the, there's a number of large-scale DCC projects that, that support growth in large areas. Um, so we sort of posit where those might be around the, 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 uh, the city. And then we develop a fund or a, a contribution rate. Well, the contribution rate currently may not be enough to top that fund up to build the project before it's needed. Uh, at the end of the life of the DCC bylaw, which is 2041, if I recall, we'll supposedly have collected all the funds. We'll su also supposedly have built all the engines. So it's just it's just timing of things. Things are proceeding faster than we. Sorry, to follow up on that, do we need to adjust anything to our DCC uh, process to catch up, or is it just sort of the way that the timing works out? We did just um, adopt a new DCC rate bylaw, and we are seeing, last year we saw increased contributions, so we are seeing 
that money built and the engineering department is looking at the time those projects, you know, can we move them a bit so we can build up those sewer DCC reserves so potentially we don't have to go Your Worship, can I just add to that question because I think it's important. So when DCC bylaws come into place, it, it takes almost two years before they're fully implemented because there's protections for applications that are in stream and wrap for building permits that are in stream. So just now we're starting to see permits being issued that are actually under the new rates that were adopted right. two years ago by council. So there's a little bit of that catch up uh, that time, but you know, the rates were recently reviewed and okay. One last thing I'd like to throw off on yet before we move on to the next slide is this does not require the port theater. So as you know, we have Grand Tarkin outstanding for the port theater. The council has committed $5.9 million to that project if the grant application is successful. We were looking at $5.8 million for short-term borrowing and $100,000 from your strategic infrastructure reserve. We should know hopefully by the end of the year, last time I checked the website, they were saying we should have a decision late this fall on the grant application. So if we are successful in that grant application, we still have to add that project into the plan, which will increase project plan, it will change our debt, and it will also change our property, projected property tax intakes. So looking at funding from general owners, property tax reduction for its projects, our 20 year now have a $7 million a year target. So this year we're just, just below the $7 million target. And next year we're moving above the $7 million. And you can see it's growing a little bit each year. Staff did have, we had challenges this year funding the project plan. We did have to go back and staff had to reevaluate projects and reprioritize so that we could fund everything that we needed to do in the five years with the funding that we had available. So I think one of the things we need to look at is what is a reasonable and sustainable increase from property taxation each year for projects. This is something we need to look at going forward. It might be part of our next 20 year investment plan review that we'll do once the facility condition assessment program wraps up or something we could do separate from that. But I do think we need to look at sustainable funding from property taxation to help support projects. Now you guys have your strategic infrastructure reserve. So this is where you can find projects or priorities that are a strategic priority for council. So right now we've only funded three projects from here because this is really your bucket of money and this is where you can choose to fund projects that you want to support from. Right now we have three projects funded from here. We have the annual allocation for property acquisition, which is 600000 a year. We have 300000 a year for pedestrian improvements. So this is unallocated. So this is where council can work with the engineering and public works department to find priority projects, projects they want to accelerate and use this fund to take advantage of that. And then we have part of the Wilcox access funded from the strategic infrastructure in 2023. So the balance of that project is currently planned to be funded from the community works fund, but we did have to fund a portion of it from your strategic infrastructure reserve and it does fit in with your strategic plan. Now what's not included here is the 100,000 commitment that you've made for the port theater if the grant application is successful. And of course if it is, then we will add that into the plan as well. Right now, in the 2020-2024 draft financial plan, your projected closing balance on the reserve is just under $3.9 million at the end of 2020. And then one last point I wanted to cover off was reserves. I know everyone always thinks we're really flush for reserves when we see the totals, but there is a few things that I'd like to point out to council. One thing is the new reserve policy has minimal balances on some of our reserves. So in 2020, for example, almost $32 million in reserves is required to meet minimum balances of some of those reserves, like our financial stability reserve, for example. Another thing to keep in mind is this includes DCC reserves. DCC reserves can only be used for projects that were identified in the DCC bylaw, and about 33% of the balance in 2020, or $45 million, is related to DCC reserves. A final point is this includes water and sewer, which of course can only be used for water and sewer infrastructure. And of the total there, about 58 million 
or 42% is water and sewer DCC reserves. Now that includes what DCC reserves and general reserves. So I, I just want you to understand there is a bunch of restrictions. It's not like we have $138 million just sitting there that we can spend on different kinds of projects. We do have restrictions on the types of projects we can be spent on. We have minimum balance requirements. The other thing too is we do tender Project planning, sorry. Councillor Bonner. Thank you. Uh, another, so you say we're, we're, we're low on our financial stability reserves? Nope. 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 Oh, okay. So, I'm sorry, minimum balances, sorry. Minimum balance requirements. Right. So we have minimum required balance, which yeah. means we haven't met those yet. No, we have. Right now we have. So right now we, when, when we transfer all the reserves into the new reserves at the end of the year, we will meet our minimum requirement balance on all the reserves. However, we will fund the post-employment benefits from our financial stability reserve. So that means that the first thing you need to do with surplus is top up any reserves that don't mean their minimum balance. So that means the first 100, 700,000 of surplus after the gains and losses on the sale of assets, now we're getting really technical, will have to go into the financial stability reserve to bring it up to its minimum. And say the surplus wasn't sufficient enough to do that, then we would have to develop a repayment plan to bring the financial stability reserve back up to its minimum balance. So as it sits right now, we're sort of okay. We're, yes, we are, we should be okay. Assuming our surplus number is good enough, we should be okay going into 2020. Good yep. people at Council's back, Councillor Barr. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Going back one slide, I'm sorry, I'm just chewing on this. The, um, the numbers, the 600 and the 300, that's what we have available to us to do strategic projects, correct? No, so the, the 600,000 is allocated to property acquisition. So each year we budget 600,000 for um, acquiring new property. If the funds are not spent, they go to our property reserve at the end of the year for future land purchases. The 300,000 is for uh, doing a pedestrian project, usually engineering and public works will bring forward some ideas for council on how you might want to spend that 300000 So that is spent, the pedestrian improvements are spent every year? Uh, yes, this year it was the project. Okay. Ms. Gurry and then oh, Councillor Bonner. Sorry, I have one more. The 900000 in 2023, does that compromise any of the two other no. So when, when we look at this, this is what we are funding from the Strategic Infrastructure Reserve. At the end of 2020, you still should have a balance of just under $3.9 million based on the draft 2020-2024 financial plan, assuming you make no changes. Yeah, uncommitted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Worship. Um, Ms. Fuller answered the question that I think um, Councillor Hemmons was looking as to what the balance of the Strategic Infrastructure Fund was, what was the overall money and not reserve was. Still money in the pot, thank God. Councillor Bonner. So my, my question would be is, is, even though we say we have 300000 for this improvements, which we can just spend as we see fit or as staff recommends, we could easily up that to 600 if we decide. Correct. Yep, as long as we have funding available we can use strategic infrastructure reserve, this is your bucket of money to take forward initiatives that you want to forward so we can make those changes as long as we have the funding reserve. I don't know that I'd use the term easily. We have to get it from somewhere, but yeah. Council well, there, there, there's a question. <laughs> my, my, so there's actually in the bank three point six ish million. At the projected closing balance at the end of twenty twenty is just under three point five million. Okay, thank you. Assuming no changes to potentially when we talk about uh, what the property tax increase is and strategies if you're looking to reduce that property tax, we do have some ideas around the strategic infrastructure reserve, so that's why I'm going to say based on the draft So I just have one more question about the reserves. If you do do 10-year project planning, so you're only seeing five years. Staff is looking long-term, we're looking 10 years, so sometimes you may go, wow, you guys have a lot of money in the reserve. But we're looking at how do we fund the next 10 years. We don't want to get to the point that we're at year six and the kitty's dry. There's no money left because we spent it in the first five years of the plan. So we are thinking long term and we are looking to make sure that we can sustain our project plan over the 10 years. So I just want to point that out that you know, you're only looking at a small snapshot in time. We're trying to have longer term thinking to keep <coughs> infrastructure going in the long term. Thank you, Worship, through you. Um, just to, uh, on that uh, long, longer-range planning, um, 
this is also nestled in, there's a 20 year asset uh, management uh, plan. Now does that each year get updated to project out 20 years? No, so the 20 year investment plan was almost a year long project to update. It's mm -hmm. a lot of work um, from all staff, not just finance staff, mm -hmm. but all the departments on the revenue structure planning, because it's a full update of our asset mm -hmm. management plan. We do costing updates on everything. We will do another one, we know we need to do another one, but it doesn't make sense to do it until we finish the condition assessment on our facilities mm -hmm. because that was really the big missing link in the last plan. So we need to update it after we have that information because we know what's going to happen in our 20-year mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. But we could see this year when we were doing our project funding, we can see this pressures. We can see that likely staff will be recommending that we continue our 1% increase for the asset management reserve. Um, it currently ends in 2022 and I would expect that you'll see staff come back with some recommendations on that. I don't see that. Disappearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to. Okay. Oh, I'm going to try to turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nice track. Uh, the uh, my question then is, be is, is as we're drawing money out of the reserves, how are we putting that back in? And so, where does that come from? Yeah. So for example, the asset management reserve, we have the one percent annual increase for property taxes that started several years ago. So we have money coming into that, and even once. If council chose not to continue the 1% increase, we still have that base funding coming into the asset management reserve. Uh, for the example, the facility development reserve, there is a portion of uh, user fees at those facilities that go into the facility development reserve. Uh, the community works fund, we have an agreement in place there until March uh, 31st of 2023. So that's not in ca after 2023, we can't, March 2023, we can't count on any money from the community works fund. Hopefully that pro program is going to continue, but that's when our assigned agreement ends. So we have to assume the funding will end at that point because we take a conservative <coughs> approach. Plus, we also don't know if that program continues quite tough for projects it might support. They could change the requirements on the types of projects that can be funded from that reserve. Uh, the IT reserve, computers, every computer in the city pays a network charge into the IT reserve. Departments pay for their copiers. Uh, the parking reserve is funded through profits from parking, so the net profit from parking, which is I was saying, we have to be careful how much we're funding from parking because that impacts our transfer to the parking reserve, and the parking reserve actually can't fund all its assets. Um, kind of think what else? Those are probably the biggest ones that have annual contributions. And then, of course, we have the cart replacement reserve, which currently has a balance of zero, but once we pay off the debt from the borrowing that we did, to undertake automation, we'll start paying into the cart replacement reserve because we know eventually we're going to have to replace all those carts. And that will take the sanitation and So okay. now I'm going to try to escape it and turn it over to Mr. Dunstan, who's going to talk about some of the IT projects. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Your Worship, uh, if I might just point. The context piece is important here. So this is your first introduction to this year's budget process. This is the capital side. Uh, we've got enough time to work our way through all the issues so that you get to a place in December where you hopefully are comfortable with where you landed. Just a reminder that this is, this is just an introduction of what staff are presenting. And some of the highlights, not all the capital, the parts that will be presented. The operating budgets, and the operating uh, business plans will be presented on the 20th of November and the 22nd of November, followed by the following Monday, uh, which the uh, pull it all together day, and then another fourth day of budgeting has been scheduled should it be necessary for council in early December. So, just this is just getting this part of this on the table and uh, some preliminary uh, information for you and maybe some preliminary feedback from council would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about three projects. The first two are currently in the plan, the project plan. And the first one that's in the project plan is uh, 2019 to 2021 content management system. This is a partnership project between IT and legislative services. The high level goal, there's it's part of a higher level um, project for records and document management across the city and the goal of that project is to have um, excellent policies and procedures for documents and records. Um, so we've made a lot of progress. We have uh, audited our records. We hired a consultant. The consultant came in and helped us build a strategic plan. 
Uh, we've done a lot of policy work, and we've also developed a records management retention schedule. So that's working well. The next step is to actually get a piece of software that allows us to follow those procedures. Um, so the idea is um, we're going to go up for RFP in the next few months. We're going to choose a vendor in early 2020. And the goal by the end of 2020 is to roll it out to four areas. We're going to roll out to IT, uh, Ledge Services, the CAO's office, and HR. Uh, the next steps, uh, in kind of in parallel, we've talked to other municipalities, we've talked to um, different consultants, we've talked to what the best practices are. We are working to organize our records internally, and then in parallel, we're going out to RFP, getting the vendor, picking the, the right software solution, and then we'll put those those, those organized uh, records into those, the new system. Uh, do you have any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I would just like to add to that. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Dunstan. Um, it has been a, um, a great um, collaborative effort between IT and Legislative Services. Really great project management, and a lot of work has gone on. This is a huge project. Um, change management um, is a large part of it, so we've taken lessons from other municipalities, what's worked, but mostly what hasn't worked, and tried to um, incorporate um, those learned um, issues into what we're doing and moving forward. So I would just like to take this time to thank everybody that's put a lot of work and effort into this. And, and you'll be hearing lots more about it in, in your capacity as, as managing your records going forward. And thank thanks to Mr. Rudolph, who's been a great champion of this as well. Thank you, Ms. Curry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second uh, project in the project <coughs> plan uh, to talk about is the replacement or upgrade of the Enterprise Resource Planning Software, which is also known as SAP. SAP um, is our financial system, does budgeting, purchasing, and payroll. The vendor has told us that it will not be supported in its current form after the 2024. Um, the vendor recommended upgrade is of sufficient size, both in terms of time, training, and cost, that the city has taken this opportunity to look back and look at what, what the next step should be. So the key points when we're looking at this high level, whatever we decide, whether we decide to upgrade or replace, we are working on the assumption that we're looking at a 20-year platform. The current system we put in in about 20, 2002, 2003, so we can make that assumption that we're looking not for a short-term solution, but for something that uh, could last for 20 years. The goal is to pick a solution that provides the less the best long-term value to the organization and to the citizens of Nanaimo. <coughs> so what we've done, uh, we did a request for information in 2018. We had a lot of vendors come in. We got to see the functionality to get a better awareness within the organization of what we will be looking for closer to that time. Uh, we've also, they provided us with rough budget numbers for a successful project. And so our next steps is to uh, start developing the RFP in 2021, keeping all the options on the table. That's right, Mr. What is the rough budget number? Mm, uh, off the top of my head, three million. So okay. much less than South was. Um, I don't have the numbers for 2002 in front of me. Um, Six. I don't think it was quite that much. I know there was about four seconded staff for the project, um, and it was about a year and actually. Yeah. So the initial, I, if, um, I threw your worship to Councillor Armstrong, I think what you think is the total investment yeah. in SAP. We, the initial investment, and then we had an upgrade, and we've, we've added a couple of modules onto that as well. So um, I, don't, I don't have the breakdown, but there were many, Compart like there was many projects that go to make up that full. I think it was eight million dollars in total. Yeah, and I guess my concern is is that what we heard about two years ago, I guess it was, was that the training wasn't there to support for the setup. Like we weren't taking advantage of it or whatever. Is there going to be ongoing training required for this, and is it going to be budgeted for instead of all of a sudden, oh, we can't use this because we don't have the training? I would say that the. Um, when we did the, the RFI with the other different vendors, including 
um, SAP, we saw that the new technology, we're basically looking at a platform that's 20 years old right now. It is difficult to use. So anything that we go to will be easier to use and will have more functionality. And so will hopefully require less training to get more functionality. If that answers your question. Yeah, I'm just always concerned that we always budget for these. And Councillor Hammonds mentioned it earlier. We don't talk about the maintenance or the training that goes with it. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to think about when we do this. Uh, through, through the chair to Councillor Armstrong, I think that we have um, done a detailed look into this budget, and I think this budget um, will give us a chance for success. Thank you. Okay, the final slide. Um, projects not included in the plan. Currently not included in 10-year project plan. Business case has been developed, so I'm going to talk about the corporate asset management system. At a high level, um, this would be a core system or organizational efficiency, similar to other areas in the city. So for finance, payroll, budgeting, purchasing, there's SAP. For utility billing, dog licenses, property tax, and bylaw, there's Tempest. For recreation, there's Perfect Mind. For uh, 911 and fire incidents, there's FDM. So this uh, corporate asset management system would be a core system for efficiencies for maintenance and asset management. We already have a few existing software solutions in this realm. GR, GIS has a fair bit of good data um, for tracking the physical assets. We do have a nearing end of life system for fleet management, and we have a 12 year old end of life custom traffic sign software, custom hydrant and dam inspection software. But for the other assets, classes within the city, um, in terms of maintenance, we have a combination of paper, spreadsheets, and individual people's memory. Um, so that is a business case that has been developed, um, and the next step forward would be to raise that business case. Councilor Hartman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and do we have a cost estimate on what this looks like? Um, my best number is 2.8 million. And, and in layman's terminology, it kind of coordinates everything that we've got different pockets and it would be under one system? Yes, an analogy would be, um, if you know when people come and deliver parcels to your door and now everything's electronic, yeah. you can track your package. Yeah. Well, uh, right now we are just giving people paper to go in the field. And sometimes <laughs> the paper doesn't come back, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Riedel, first of all, is this is an example of where we're behind uh, in, you know, we rely so heavily on technology to deliver services and to be efficient. And this is one of the major core services, uh, backbone systems that we should have in place. Most cities have them in place and we don't. So we're well behind on this and I'm not sure what the clear answer would be, but the electronic document management is another example. I actually implemented one of those in the 90s. So we still don't have that. Uh, so we're, we're behind, and this is part of our challenges is in, when we talk about catching up and our, some of our administrative challenges to get us up to a level of higher performance and functionality, because the expectations of citizens are pretty high, and they should be, because all these tools exist. So we're, we're, this is the one project in our funding envelope that we're struggling to find a way to uh, fund, and secondly, there's only so much capacity in the organization to deliver on these major projects at, at one time, so we have to sequence them in a certain way. So you'll hear Mr. Sims in particular speak passionately about this project during his business plan presentation uh, and some of the challenges, but uh, it's just a, it's a reality and it's just an example of where we're, we're finding ourselves trying to catch up but at, a, at, a, at a pace that's financially and administratively doable. So this is a highlight of that example. Did you want to say something? No, I think Mr. Rudolph covered it nicely. I would just add that the, you know, the, the 2.8 million is the total investment. It would be over a four or five year period. So that's so oh, divide okay. that by four or five on an annual basis to, to get us up to something. In your worship, you will see a business case on that as part of the business plan submissions to you. I think I have it correct. Councillors Hemmons, Turley, and Gesselbrock in order. Thank you. All right. Your worship. Um, when I think of IT projects on the horizon, I hear a lot about GIS and enhancing what we're doing around GIS and embedding these other sim these systems in it. 
am I missing that this is part of the GIS project? Or is that something that we don't have on the books? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hemmons. GIS is a, a core um, physical asset, tracking the actual physical, physical locations of those assets. But with a corporate asset management system would be another piece that would integrate tightly with that. And then you'd be able to click on um, a pump or something and you'd be able to see who last visited it, what was the maintenance, what's the condition, when is the next predictive or the uh, next um, maintenance for the future. So it's a, it's a, it sits on GIS and you need to have a very good GIS um, asset layer in order to, do, to work this, but it is a separate piece. Okay, and a follow-up if I may. Um, I've heard of other jurisdictions who have GIS tapped into, residents can just take a photograph, say, of a pothole. Um, and it can go into the GIS system and it can be put in a queue of, you know, these are all the, the works that we're doing and this is how much it will cost, et cetera, et cetera. Is that on the horizon for us at all? Good question. Um, that's certainly something we actually have a very um, not publicized version of that right now. So we have a garbage app called Recollect out there. And if you actually have the app, you can actually submit requests. Now, that is, um, let's say that's kind of stage one. Now the next thing when you talk to someone like Surrey is that they take all the public requests that come through and they funnel it through a system like this so they have all their citizen requests go through and then it goes funneled out. Right now what we do is we take these, so if you use the app, you put in a request, you say I have a pothole, you can send a photo, but then it's going to be email and then someone emails to someone else, someone else might print it off, give it to someone else. So that's, the rea this is the middle piece that allows more seamless from citizen all the way through to work order, to fix, to update, in, to tie into this GIS. Thank you. And just a comment if I made, I, I think that would be a brilliant community engagement piece of where folks can see, you know, projects that they've identified and they're probably not the only ones, um, kind of where they sit in the queue of our priorities and how much it'll cost and when they can expect remediation, et cetera, et cetera. I think that would be maybe a wave of the future, but really quite interesting. Councillor Kesselbrock. Thank you, Worship. Um, just, just one thank you uh, for this um, presentation, and I can really see, I mean, our IT systems are such a critical backbone of how we operate and uh, can make things so much more efficient, so investing in this, well, I can understand the stresses around sort of other things that we need to invest in and, and capacity. Um, so I'm glad that it's, it's on the radar and we're, we're working towards it. Um, a question, uh, just with with these new systems that we're going to um, be updating, how, how much role does AI software play into these systems now and, and, and its, its application? I know it's just becoming more prevalent and can increase capacity. Uh, and, curious if it's applicable at all. Right. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Gesselbrack, um, AI is kind of in, of in its infancy for certain things. And I think um, when you look at a specific problem, business problem, AI can really help. So in certain areas, I, um, my favorite example is during the California wildfires, there was like 30,000 houses damaged and they used AI to look at the 30,000 photos or 30,000 uh, pictures of aerial photos of the damage and within 95% certainty they could say to the insurance company yeah immediately process this complaint these 3% we need to look at and these 2% are kind of so that's the kind of neat thing but with I can see AI down the road when we have um, uh, have the system in place for a number of years and we have a whole bunch of maintenance records and we have a whole bunch of asset information that's when we can actually start applying AI to figure out when is the best time to replace something, but first you have to have the core um, data in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So right now we're kind of focusing on data and then tracking. Sort of. yeah. But it is something definitely to keep mm -hmm. your eye on, yes. I can see my quill pen budget is out the window. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bonner, the work at Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I don't want to steal Mr. Sims' uh, presentation, but we get it. But wouldn't we fund this software out of the asset management reserve? Uh, it seems like a 
exactly where it should come from. Through your bridge of Council of Honor, no, we wouldn't because this is a brand new project. This is a brand new project. Um, the asset management reserves are meant for renewal. So if we're not renewing one, we are going to more is creating Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Dunstan, thank you very much for the information. Uh, this seems to me to be an important backbone of our organization, and I'm very concerned when I hear Mr. Rudolph indicate that we're so far behind in some areas, so this is certainly something for Council to be aware of and flag for future discussion. Uh, just one minor point uh, you mentioned as part of your presentation in passing the Perfect Mind uh, system, and I'm just curious, uh, maybe Mr. Uh, Harding is a better person to answer this, seen as we went to this fairly recently, and I know there were some bugs, of course, when it first came on board. Are we happy with how it's functioned? Uh, Your Worship, uh, perfect, perfect mind? Yes. We're making some good strides. Um, it's, it's evolving. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I think, what, what are Nicely the, done. Well, I think one of the political <laughs> answers for senior. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the, one of the, the signs of that is um, the last two registrations were done really well, and we didn't, we had very little concerns or, or um, um, complaints. Um, like any software, it's always, it's always a, Change. Perfect Mind is still evolving, and that we knew that going in as, as a cloud-based program, and as other municipalities are coming on the stream throughout the province, it is it's continuing to develop and evolve. So that's why that was meaning it's still it's still developing. Um, okay. Through the chair to Councillor Thorpe, if I could just add, um, the previous system we had in place was very. Um, mature and so we had it for about 10 years where there was no change but right now in IT there is a ton of change that's happening and um, we are improving and I think that's the main thing as long as the trend is in the right direction so thank you Councillor Armstrong just some clarification when Councillor Hammond said that the, the citizens would be able to track it they wouldn't have access though to to where the, their file or their complaint was would they um, in our system there's two parts to that so if you um, look at what Vancouver has done. They have an app on their phone, and then when they make a complaint um, or raise a concern, you can actually get a history of all the concerns that you've raised, and you can track the progress. The method that we currently have, where you can, through your recollect, you can submit something, there is no two way communication back to see um, if that has been resolved, and so it's up to the in party to decide whether to update the person or not. Where, so you, you would need multiple pieces. You would need a piece like this in order to take all those work orders, get them out in the field, have them completed, send that information to a citizen engagement portal. This act, there's Some of these providers provide citizen engagement portals, um, and then you would guide that back to the original so requester. So they would have access then to their own, they would know where their neighbors may be or whatever, they would know. Oh, yeah, they would, sorry, yes, they would only know their own request. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me, and I'll try not to let my passion show too much here. But this, is, <laughs> this is one of those uh, software projects that does build on top of and, and adds a great deal of depth to the sort of inherent information that we have in our GIS system. And this creates a bit of knowledge and allows allows it to be integrated across the entire organization. What we can't quantify for council is the, the benefit, the financial benefit we would get out of using a software like this. <coughs> it's not hard to imagine that deferring infrastructure as a result of smarter decisions, thanks to this, um, would sort of, make, you know, the savings alone would, would, would pay for itself in a, in a way. And I, I, that's maybe sounding a little bit like selling it. And maybe I am. There's certainly value in it. And, and as Mr. Rudolph said, it, there's numerous uh, organizations across the province that are, are using softwares just like this and, and we're sad about it. Councilor Brown, just wondering to worship Mr. Sims if that goes both ways the one next to us we need to be replacing things quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to suggest we take a, uh, I'm going to be really generous, a six minute break. <laughs>
I call this back to order. Mr. Rosen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, let's talk about infrastructure now. Uh, so I've got a number of slides, and uh, we've basically selected certain projects that we think would be of interest to Mayor and Council. So it's certainly not all the projects we have on the go. Um, and I think I'm going to work through them fairly quickly, just in the interest of time. So if there's questions, obviously just jump in and we can talk more about a particular project. So this slide is a little bit of an overview. Uh, as Ms. Fuller explained earlier, a lot of our projects are renewal projects. So the vast majority of our water distribution, water supply, sanitary sewer, and drainage, the vast majority of those are simply renewal projects. So we have an older water main, um, it's got a break history, for example, we would put that in the, in the queue for renewal. And the other thing we quite often do is we try and bundle projects together to get good value, as well as disrupt neighborhoods as little as possible. So we try and coordinate all the various components of projects uh, in a way that makes, makes the most sense. Uh, you can see the vast majority of the dollars are actually in transportation projects. They tend to be quite expensive, and uh, that's just the nature of the nature of things. So I'm going to jump right into some projects here. So this millstone trunk, sir, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, sewer sewer capacity and some of the challenges we have around growth. Uh, so this millstone trunk, sir, it serves about 30% of the city, and we've been picking off what we call the bottlenecks over the past sort of 10 years, and we've upgraded sections along butter tubs through Bowen Park, and then you can see here we've got a couple of the next sections that are in the queue that are, that are uh, of a capacity concern. So you can see uh, <coughs> the one through Bowen Park, it's going to be fairly, it may be contentious. There will be some impacts to the park. We'll, we'll put back the trees, we'll, we'll improve the trails, we'll, we'll do public consultation, we'll, we'll do what we can to mitigate the adverse impacts. They are extremely important projects. And Mr. Rosen, can I just ask a question around that? Because you've gone right to the, um, the obvious political implication of, of the project. Um, for practical purposes, there is no other reasonable way of completing that project without taking down some trees in Bullock Park. Is that fair to say? So for a project like that, we certainly have looked at all the alternatives. We even looked at long siphons that run along different alignments that would run as a pressure sewer. They're just not, they're not viable, they're not economical. There's, there's disadvantages to them. So we've We've sort of zeroed in on this particular alignment. One of the challenges is it's, it's essentially a replacement of the sewer in the existing location. The, pro the problem is, when it was put in in the 70s, these trees have grown for 50 years. They're, they're quite a bit larger than they were back then. So the root balls are bigger and the trees are bigger. And so it's, just, it's just a little bit more challenging to get machinery in there and, and so on. So. Thank you. Okay. Next project. So this one that council might not be aware of. So we've had couple of fairly significant storm events in the past couple of years. Uh, you can see the little picture on the, the left there. That's actually a catch basin on the street that's overflowing. The water's coming from, from the pipes because the pipes didn't have capacity. So we had two of these events, one in May of 16 and one in or, yeah, September 16th of 2018. And we had a number of locations around the north end that were impacted by this. They had some overland flow, some flooding, and so on. So the little graph on the right, that's just a way that we quantify the probability of a rainfall like that event occurring. You can see the red line is, is actually, it's the September 16th event. You can see the, uh, these lines here, this yellow and the orange, they represent the 100 year event. And you can see this one's quite a bit higher than that. So what it's telling us is we're seeing a couple of these events occurring when they're predicted to only occur once every couple of hundred years. And we're seeing two in a couple of years. So this is, this is quite striking for us. So we're, we're currently in a process of studying this and trying to update our underlying sort of probability data. But we know that there's going to be some upgrades that are necessary on the north slope, a couple of these pinch points, we call them. In fairness, we obviously, uh, we, there was a wonderful presentation at UBCM this year uh, around uh, natural assets. And I, I'm, I'm going to assume that we have looked at and considered whether or not, you know, butter tubs forms a natural asset, if you will, that, that that deals with flooding issues. I take it, given the location, given the amount of development around there, it's not a practical alternative. We're just going to have to build bigger pipes. Is that fair to say? One of the challenges in this particular catchment, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeing it get hit so hard, is the amount of impervious area. So it's the catchment includes Woodgrove, things like Costco, a lot of those mall developments, as well as quite a lot of um, 
housing, like single family home, a lot of roads. There is a lot of impervious area in this catchment, which is why it gets hit so hard. Um, so we certainly have looked at alternatives such as detention storage and, and other things, <coughs> but this is one of the ones that really drives us to this compelling argument around developing a stormwater utility where users of the stormwater system pay an appropriate fair share of it. So they would potentially pay based on the amount of impervious surface that they have that contributes to the to the system, right? So, so Councillors Hammonds, Gesselbrock, and Bonner, please. Thank you through you to Mr. Rosen. Um, I was struck by the fact that we're having these natural events that are predicted to happen only once every 100 or 200 years, and yet we're having them repeatedly. And I'm curious, there are some advocacy efforts to um, from municipalities to the federal government to cost out what climate change is going to look like um, on for cities. And I know Vancouver. I attended a presentation at UBCM where they were they were actually you know they have a list of all of the projects that they are going to be investing in because of climate change. And I wonder if we do something similar. So a, I guess my question is, when we see these these events occurring at the rate that they are, is that, in your opinion, due to climate change, and B, if it is, are we tracking it so we have that on the books um, to be able to use to advocate for, for federal dollars? So I'll, I'll answer it in sort of a couple different layers there. So in terms of, you know, is this climate change and what are we doing in terms of adapting for climate change? So in all our sort of sanitary sewer and stormwater water modeling and sort of predictions of what's going to happen in the future, we're following all the current best practices in terms of accounting for climate change and it's substantial there's a substantial impact so if you look at like the like the stormwater model for this catchment and you look at what the what the probability of a, like an overflow is today and you compare that out to like 2050 or 2080 or 2090 you go from like a few pipes being sort of red to the whole thing like so it it's substantial the amount of impact from climate change is predicted to be very substantial so we, we know we're not going to be able to afford to replace all these pipes. So then I guess that comes down to the, the sort of the funding question. We do have through, through Dale's group, through DSD, um, there's a study that's going on right now in terms of uh, climate change. So its adaptation includes sea level rise as well as a number of other measures. And I'm not sure, maybe Dale, you could chime in here if this includes uh, like a funding strategy. Uh, so the, the first part of the project would just be looking at identifying the risks and then coming up with adaptation to those risks and those hazards. So. Yes, ultimately we'll right, anticipate a list of projects um, we're expected to come back to Council in November with an update on that project. Your Worship, just to clarify, I think the standards that were in place at the time of the development in this area are different than the state. What, what I think you need to hear this, that our standards are different, because that was your question. We don't have the, the same situations in other parts of the city because our current standards for impervious and, and catch catches conditions and all those things are different, correct? Can you just comment on that? So so our newer standards do accommodate on site <coughs> water management and that type of thing. I think you need to say that. And, but this is this is a legacy area that has a, that has got a, a different set of challenges. Yes, cer certainly like all the different areas of the city that were developed at different time periods, they they developed to the standard of the day, whatever that was, whenever that was. In this particular area, a lot of the development occurred in the 80s and the 90s when the standard was, for the most part, try and keep it in the pipe. There wasn't a lot of forethought around climate change and what those impacts were. Uh, certainly currently, we're a lot more aware of that and we establish what we call an overland flow path. So we know we, know we can't provide uh, a pipe that can handle everything potentially for the future. So we, we try and provide a certain reasonable level of service because if, if we were to provide massive pipes for everything, the cost would be obscene and we'd never be able to afford to manage or replace or renew that kind of a system. So we make sure we have these overland flow paths established, safeguarded, and so on. So we've been doing that for quite a long time now, um, but in these older neighborhoods, they may not have been developed in a way that um, established those overland flow paths. So this is one area that, that, that's like that, where we generally don't have these overland flow paths. So those will get mobilized during a, like a large extreme event, like a one in a hundred or one in two hundred year flow path or event. And because they're not protected and established, they, 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 they just go, they go where they go. And if somebody has put some landscaping there or they've put a garden shed or maybe someone's house is there, like there can be impacts for sure. So it's, it's quite a concern and staff have been working on uh, ways to deal with that, but it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, sort of a, 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 a risky, but 
it's fraught with quite a bit of liability, so we just have to be a bit careful about it. Councillor Gessler and Councillor Vaughn. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Rural, that, that was kind of my question, um, was that uh, are we in a place, do, is our policy set in place in terms of having a, a water balancing approach, trying to find whatever ways with the, uh, a more permeable services to get the water into, into the ground? Um, the best way as opposed to you know, large areas of impervious services funneling into to large pipes. We have set the policy and established the engineering standards to do that now um, and even <coughs> look at areas like this where we can adjust things and take advantage more of potentially overland flow paths and, and other areas that can catch, catch water. Yeah, so certainly there's sort of two things to think about though. I mean, there's the, there's the extreme event having systems in place to be able to handle extreme events. And then there's the routine sort of one and two year rainfalls. So developments are required to be able to manage on site these normal routine rainfalls. Mm -hmm. So they have to have detention systems, they have to have um, infiltration, what, whatever systems their engineers come up with to be able to handle that routine, regular uh, rainfall on their own site. Now, it's be quite unreasonable to expect them to be able to handle a one in a hundred year storm event. Mm -hmm. So there still has to be systems in place on their site and then downstream to be able to look after the, the more extreme events. So there's two sort of things going on there. Okay. Councilor yeah. Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Through you to Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, my, first of all, can you tell me where the North Slope is? I don't know where that is. So the North Slope, it, this might be a little bit of a staff lingo. It's, it's the, the area that we're talking about here is this catchment that we've got defined by this. We call it the Eagle Point catchment. Generally, the North Slope is the, the slope to the ocean off sort of like the north end of Nanaimo, uh, running from sort of like the Lanceville border through down to where the terrain gets a bit more rocky, I think it's generally what we have considered. Um, and uh, I like your point you made earlier about um, um, requiring some sort of payment system for having to use the storm sewers. I think Victoria has something there where they actually, you can get your taxes reduced by making sure more of your water remains on your land or close to your land. Um, would that be, would we be better off going that route to this area of getting people to disconnect their lines from the sewer lines uh, so for the storm sewers um, and pay money that way as opposed to paying it um, through bigger, building bigger pipes. So that's a, that's a really good point. There's a little bit of a timing challenge there because if we were to adopt a stormwater utility, um, that would take a number of years for us to go through the consultation and the process. Like it took, it took Victoria, I'm not sure exactly, but I know it was probably five plus years to be able to go from the starting point to actually implementing that in place. And there's a couple of other municipalities around BC and, and, and we've been to sort of seminars and courses on this. So there's a number of other communities we could sort of model after. Um, Victoria's taken a little bit more of a, uh, an approach where they actually look at impervious area on every single parcel. So even a single family lot, for example, they would measure the amount of roof area, the amount of paved or whatever they classify as impervious on the lot. They would, they would account for that, but there has to be processes in place to, to manage that so if someone changes, say they go and they pave the driveway or they build a new house, there has to be processes to maintain all that, which is quite, quite a lot of effort. And my understanding is they have several staff that they had to hire just to be able to support those processes. So what we're actually contemplating is maybe a system where it's not quite so detailed for residential, but maybe for commercial or industrial or institutional, we do actually maintain and measure the amount of impervious area. So once you have that stormwater utility established and in place, then there'd be incentives for people that are contributing a lot to actually mitigate that. So there has to be mechanisms for them to, for example, if they decide to build an, in, an infiltration gallery or something, be some capital cost there, but they would want to get that benefit. So there has to be some, some system in place, but it can take quite a long time to, to actually um, affect some change at the outfall. So one of the challenges we're seeing is we've had at least two major events in a couple of years that have, that have been quite an issue. Um, we just don't think there's, there's it's, it's a risk question, and it's, I guess it's a council question. Do you want to continue to have um, <clears throat> that sort of risk exposure here, or would you prefer to um, deal with it sooner rather than later, but, but it's going to cost some money to, to get rid of that risk in the short term? Does that answer your question? Sort of, yes. Okay. <laughs> we got more work to do. We, we do. We definitely have more work to do. 
Okay, I'll move on. Uh, Metro Drive, I think we've all talked about this one on a number of occasions. Uh, just give you a bit of an update on it. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at uh, public consultation coming up in November, so potentially a conventional open house that we'll be having for that, as well as we're going to be targeting uh, businesses and adjacent landowners for specific consultation around impacts to their, their properties. Councillor Martin. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. Um, for the budget there, this was a project that we had the gas tax fund was moving up a step on this. Yeah, yeah so, so with that, with, with Metro, we originally had envisioned it being done in two phases. So right. phase one and then phase two. So phase one was originally included in the budget for 2020. So with the gas tax one time, yeah. extra amount of funding we had there, what we proposed to do is to fast track phase two. So we moved that up to 2021, and so the whole project, the idea is the whole project would be complete by the end of 2021. Now, one of the things that we've been talking about recently is there's a couple of grant opportunities that are out there, um, potentially for the city, and this is one project that might be a very good candidate for a uh, grant application. So oh. depending on the outcome of that discussion, we might be back in front of council, asking council to um, essentially pass a motion applying for a, gr for a grant to help. So that five million for 2021 is with the move up. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I just have a question. I don't know if that's redesigned. Really you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we voted on the uh, double gate, they were supposed to be on street parking. Is that going to be um, accommodated for that design? Which? Double gate, which is on Metro. That's you know the that little mall, and there's the new condos, and then the older condos, the townhomes. And one of the reasons I believe was that there would be on the street parking. I, I, unless I mix that up, because I know we've had a few that way that we voted for it because we said that we would give them on street parking, one being uplands, the new one on uplands by the mother group. Because so, we spoke three that we said that we would give them on street parking, or on street parking, so I'm just wondering if that, that was the one of them. Well, one of the things I can say is that we're, we're, <coughs> we're incorporating on street parking where we can, where we have uh, an appropriate width or a cross section that's able to provide that. Um, perhaps Jamie's giving me the thumbs up, so it sounds like we are providing on street parking there. Yeah, so um, in front of that long that frontage, we're looking at, at uh, exchanging parking for landscaping. So it will be where possible, but we are going to try and manage uh, on street parking in that area. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Just to comment on her grant, I think it's great. Um, Especially with particular to this project, I think there's <coughs> wonderful opportunities from letters of support from the school district uh, because they have uh, uh, connectivity challenges with the, the, the school there and some, there's some concern there. So I think they would probably be highly supportive of this. Um, and also the regional district of Nanaimo in our that strategic plan, um, uh, active transportation. So I, knowing some of the provincial grants that are available um, and attending a session and then looking here this year, they highly recommend it, including letters of support from other governing bodies that um, uh, would support that project. So I was putting that out there of what I heard in the conference that Jamie was there as well, but we uh, attended some different sessions. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on Metro? Or uh, Boxwood Connector. So this is one that's been sort of out there for a number of years. Uh, we've been working on it since I started with the city about 10 years ago. Um, we actually have a construction project going on there right now where we're building phase one, which is essentially just a preload for it. So it's got, um, it's what's called a brownfield site actually. So it's a site that was originally, like historically, it was a, a fill site for all kinds of unfortunate uh, deposits that we've had to go in and mitigate. And we've had to have uh, environmental consultants involved, um, BC contaminated sites regulation, there's a bunch of sort of rules around contamination levels and zoning and so on. So we've had to spend quite a bit of effort moving soils around, capping it, basically getting this brownfield site up to shape so it can support the proposed use here, which is the road, the stormwater detention facility, and ultimately it'll be uh, potential for development in the south uh, remainder there as well. Um, so the plan is, so next year the plan is to start detailed design. And I know there were some questions earlier about some of the, the details around like cycling and pedestrian facilities, particularly around the roundabout. This concept was created 
five plus years ago. So it was it was best practice at the time. So what I can say is, as we're moving forward into the detail design, we'll implement the best practices, complete street standards of the day uh, when we do that. Uh, roundabouts are inherently a bit of a challenge for, for cyclists and not, they're not great for pedestrians. So I, I think we all acknowledge that, but uh, it's a bit of a trade-off. So. Any questions on this one? Councilor Brown? Yes, um, that additional land, does that present opportunity at, at the point to be parcelized and sold? Is there enough? The remainder to the south there? Yeah. Potentially. But there are some limitations because of the contaminated sites, those certain certain uh, limits in terms of zoning, what it, what it can be. So. <coughs> Just really briefly, this, this project can be considered, while it started, it has genesis in transportation, it can be really considered a success as far as a brownfield remediation. We're actually recreating a lake that was there and has been disappeared and, and filled in. Uh, using that as a stormwater management, it will be a wetland. And oh, by the way, there's a road there that helps cut around Bowen, right? And we connect through the Bowen, off Bowen bikeway as well. So it, it's, a, it's an overarching successful project. Just to, to raise a point here, um, when we discuss this, can we lump it all together? Because I would have to step up that if we're making decisions on it. Because you live nearby. I, I would be directly affected by that. Ms. Curie. Um, thank you, Richard. I don't believe there's any decision <laughs> on this presentation. This is yeah, um, today, yeah. this is just a presentation. Um, on the preliminary project plan. Just for future Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rose. Okay, so the next slide here, this is actually a continuation of the Boxwood, uh, Boxwood Road down to the south, so you can see a um, uh, developer has built this connection down here, and we actually have it open now down to East Wellington. That little connection, that um, connection between where Box, the new Boxwood ended and Wellington, it's, it's an old road. It was built a long time ago. It was not meant for a lot of traffic. It doesn't have any pedestrian facility. And so this project is meant to address all those sorts of concerns. It'll include uh, a multi-use trail on, uh, I believe it's on the east side, as well as some upgrades along East Wellington to the intersection uh, to improve access and so on. This slide here is actually the continuation of that again. So the idea is this off Bowen bikeway. So it'll continue all the way from the Boxwood connector we saw up in the north end, so Ross Town Road area, all the way down through Boxwood. And then 2021 with this Mad Madsen Road project. And then this green part here, this is already this is already in place with the BC Hydro project. This is envisioned to happen in conjunction with development in the near future. And then in 2020, there'll be a connection over here between Casper to allow connection off of Bowen. And then ultimately, if we can get all these things in place, the next obvious link would be uh, a jump across the Millstone River to, to Butter Tubs, which would provide a connection all the way from sort of Rosstown Road area through to the uh, Trans Canada Trail into BIU. So, quite a quite an interesting. Link. Mr. Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. I'm having a hard time orienting here. Can you point out Bowen Road on that map, please? Oh, that's right. Top corner. Okay. This is East Wellington right here. This is the, the big hydro facility. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Is that the area that the uh, truck drivers were concerned about when we met at the um, public works or whatever it was, engineering committee? Because they were concerned about them not having the ability to turn without hitting mm -hmm. cyclists because they wouldn't be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I do remember it. I don't remember if that was the, the precise area. Has that been taken into consideration because that is an area that is mostly used by large commercial transport vehicles and at, at that, I think it was Public Engineering Works, whatever committee it was, there was a lot of concern raised by the representative from the truck industry about that. I think most of it was the, the segment of Boxwood Road, sort of north of that new segment there. Okay. So there's there's some stretches there that have some large industrial parcels that large trucks come and go from. Yeah. And there's there's access issues there in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, any, anytime a large truck is making a movement like that. Yeah. So that's one of the big challenges. If we're going to create this off and bikeway, having that mixture of industrial traffic and cyclists and pedestrians because a lot of Boxwood Road was never built with sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's... That remains a big concern because we see lots of accidents this year where the truck drivers technically aren't at fault because they come up behind them and they're supposed to stop back and they never do. So that's just a concern. Thank you. That's 
Good morning. Just one quick question, if I may. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the width development, do we have any idea when that might happen? I asked the same question, and I got an answer potentially fairly soon. Oh, good. Okay. Perhaps Dale might have more information? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the witness development there, do we have an idea if and when that might happen? <coughs> so the, uh, the townhouse is right to the right of the yellow line. Obviously, we're built uh, in the 90s. The second phase of that, which is immediately to the north, that vacant land, it's right under the label with Nanaimo. It was always anticipated to be a future phase. So it's with that, it's with that future phase. We've had, I would describe them as preliminary discussions with, um, with groups about that property, but I don't believe there's anything that's, that's imminent on that right now. So would, would that for, so show up as a community amenity contribution, or? Uh, it could show up as a community amenity. It could also show up as frontage uh, works and services, possibly, depending on if that's been dedicated through there. I, I, don't, I don't believe the road's been dedicated. Um, so it's likely, uh, it's likely an amenity to be been secured. What times? Moving on? Okay. Uh, time break connector. So this is one, I think we've talked to council about this a few times in the past. This has been on our books for at least 20 years. It's been identified as a potential uh, transportation upgrade. It would provide additional capacity and redundancy to the south end. Um, we're in the process of conducting a, a study that would look at sort of all the potential options, not just this one, as well as alignment options for this. Um, there is a, a wetland that the current alignment um, would go through. Um, back when this was originally concepted out, there wasn't quite the same level of concern, uh, environmental concern. Um, so we have had a study done that looked at what the impacts would be, what the mitigation measures would be. It is, it is still considered a, a viable alignment, although the mitigation measures that we would have to undertake are quite substantial. So we know the South End is quite interested in having this type of project <coughs> proceed. We've moved it out in the plan a little bit to essentially start in 2027. So we've delayed it a little bit, uh, deliberately. Gives us a little bit more time to get our head around what the best project here is. There's also a lot going in terms of, a lot going on in the south end in terms of potential development that would tie into this and would potentially impact. So any questions on this project? But the impact would be to take substantive traffic over the off extension road. Uh, am I missing this? Yeah, so, yes. sorry, so. This is the project, you see this red line here? Yeah. So this is what we call the cranberry connector. And this was just a conceptual alignment that was developed many years ago. The wetland that we were talking about is sort of in this zone here. There's road right away with challenges up through here. There's a trailer park on, on this side, as well as this Wexford Creek kind of continues along up here. There's a lot of, a lot of challenges with this project, both technical, environmental, as well as the property and so on. And, and the red up in the right corner. That's part of the. That, sorry, that's not part of this. That's Max Road. Okay. Really, what we're talking about here is this piece from here to here. The idea is to create additional capacity and redundancy from Cranberry up to 110. Also, that's your mark. So, because I, I just think this is an area which is really impacted right now with the traffic. And we've heard from local residents around there. So is the intention then that the back is the highway, I'm assuming? The back road there? The, the, the block road, yes, yeah, the parkway and then the, uh, the highway on the other side. Yeah, so I'm looking at the island highway. Because um, it's where it's a drawing here where it comes out, it's incredibly crazy there, right? So, this will leave traffic from having to go into that highway and being able to connect to the tenth. Yes. And is there any way we can do this sooner than later? So, so right now there's two intersections with the highway. Right. There's, there's a single intersection here and a single intersection yep. here. And they're both operating far below the level of service that you would normally expect a signal to operate at. So they're, they're, not, they're not functioning at the level you'd, you'd want them to be at. This, this, this project would provide capacity relief for both of those yeah. intersections. 
Um, so so we, we've put it out in the plan here. It's an expensive project, it's very yeah. expensive. And part of the rationale is it gives us a little bit of time to figure out what the best project is. It may not end up looking like that. It might end up being right. slightly different than that. Um, the other thing is, you know, depending on the alignment, there might be a bunch of property acquisition that you know, we would have to explore that. Right. And then there's also budget pressures. So a project like this would be funded out of transportation, like roads, DCCs. Yeah. And so we'd have to have enough money in our roads, DCC reserves to be able to do, to do this project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, very similar comment to Councillor Martman's and that's that um, uh, I just voted no to a development because of this, this road yes. issue exactly. Um, and hearing from residents that they're waiting three and four lights um, in the morning and in the afternoon coming coming back into that area. So really glad to see that it's, it's you know, we're doing some studies, but 2027 feels like a long way out for this project. That's your problem. Well, we're on the subject. Um, this actually, though, doesn't alleviate the problem of not enough exits out of the area in case there's an emergency. Well, you'd, you'd, you'd still have that bottleneck under the parkway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it provides some redundancy, but it's not perfect. Yeah, okay. Next project, Lake Saya. So this is one that, uh, for, for budgetary reasons and for some um, ability to coordinate with the, the school district and VIU, we've pushed it out a couple of years. Uh, it was a very expensive project, and we were able to find a way to do some pretty substantial asphalt patching on Lake Asaya that allows us to sort of push the project out in a couple of years, buys us some time. Thank you, Worship. In my earlier comment, I was looking at projects that we could possibly move forward on um, sooner than later, and, and this is one of the ones that caught my eye, because it's, it's part of that corridor of bicycle roads that parallel Bowen. Um, and I was on there in a bus this morning, and we were backed up for three long walks. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering uh, what would be required to move this up at least two, if not three years. Take two minutes. So it's a large project. I think altogether it's close to $10 million. We had it spread over three years. And because of the nature of the infrastructure, there's a lot of storm drainage infrastructure, which is general revenue. There's a lot of paving, which is general revenue. There's a lot of sort of road upgrades. It, it, it's a very general revenue intensive project. So that's why it's, it's, very, it's very sensitive to sort of where we, where we sort of time this one. Certainly from a staff capacity standpoint, capacity standpoint we, can, we could accelerate it again, put, put it back where it was, but the budgetary implications are substantial. And, and perhaps Ms. Fuller could comment on that, but it would, it would be very challenging to, to fund. So to your worship, I think this is a really interesting project too because it's um, the downtown cycle loop with the Fourth and Albert connection, with the off bone bike lane, and the upgrades at the hospital. We're really starting to get a formation of a minimum grid there between the hospital area, EIU, and downtown, which covers a lot of density, and then it also connects into, uh, those have connections into the inn and spine. So all that to say, I think it's highly important to see this project realized as quickly as possible. Those other ones, I understand this budget, but I, I would be really interested in, can this be done through things like green municipal fund and all those sort of things, is there potential there to get it done? Thank you for support for Councillor Armstrong. No, just quickly from Ron, but isn't one of the reasons that you are waiting on it is to get some more assistance from the school district and the BIA? Like, because they're going to be doing their plans and you want to align with their plans? Or am I in a sense of so, so a lot of the frontage of the project does does front yeah. school district property as well as BIU so property. We so we, we have talked to the school district and they are they are okay. hoping that NDSS will undergo some, some renovation, some replacement renewal, like whatever they're envisioning in the near future. So if they do that, we would be able to coordinate with them, and uh, that would be helpful. Uh, and as well, VIU would be helpful if we can coordinate with them as well. So it gives us a bit more time to, to coordinate uh, with both entities. 
Thank you. Councilor yeah. Robert. I mean, I'm not sure about VIU. I mean, this only goes to 4th Street, which is the very corner of their uh, property. Um, and then, it, and then we've been going down forth in terms of bike road, bicycle lane, and that sort of stuff. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure we need, that would be a really good reason to delay it, just because we're not sure what they're going to be doing in the future. Um, and and, and re, regardless, even if we do redo in front of NDSS, um, it, we, we would just do it the way they thought that they might be going in the future. I, I just don't, I would really like to see this sooner than later, honestly. I think we should try and look at funding for it. No, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> just, just there was no question. Yeah, Councilor Chairman. So, unless I'm, to you, Your Worship, um, unless I'm misunderstanding this, we're not four laning bike aside, it's three laning two lane, two lane, so it's not going to resolve the issue that Councilor Vaughn was concerned about, about backup traffic, because that's not. The, the, the infrastructure is not going to expand it to be a capacity for that. So the only thing that's going to uh, help is, is the bicycle lane and any, any utilities that need upgrading. And you know, we don't know whether they, at this point in time, need the upgrading. If we do, I, we haven't heard about it. So, so I, I agree. I don't think there's a big rush on this. Just to add a little bit of information there, there is some utility work that, that does need to be done as part of this project. We have a, a large storm sewer in there that's near the end of its life. And <clears throat> it was going to be part of the, it is part of the project, um, but we can continue to maintain it. Um, it just requires a little bit more intensive maintenance. There's a lot of roots and, and so on in the pipe, so it just requires more, more of that, <coughs> as well as any other, like there's water main replacement as well. So. I think it's safe to say we're potentially looking at another date, even if we manage to stay at past 12 today. So I'm not suggesting, of course, that you don't ask pertinent or important questions, but uh, we have a lot of material to get through. Do carry on, Mr. Rose. Okay, let's move on here. <laughs> Downtown Cycle Loop. I won't spend much time on this one because it will be coming up at a later, a later report. Um, but I will say that the overall Downtown Cycle Loop is envisioned to include the whole entire piece here. This particular project, which is scheduled for 21, includes these two segments, from there and then down Wentworth, which also ties into the Albert Ford Bikeway, which provides that portal link between downtown and VIU. So the part that you're going to see later on is potentially accelerating this piece here. Uh, and then this is just a potential cross-section. So what it would be would be on the, on the east of the water side would be a bi-directional cycle track. With a, with a buffer, this would be a planter or some sort of barrier or potentially a curb. There's some impacts to the parking and stuff like that. It's generally pretty good, and I think we'll get more into that uh, later. So, can we save any questions till later? Councillor okay. Hammond. Well, actually, no. <laughs> um, so, really excited about this. Really curious from Mafio or Mafeo to Wallace Street. That is a very, very tricky um, piece for cyclists. Will this infrastructure of the dual will that continue up there? Or is that just for around Maffeo and downtown? So what's envisioned for this particular project is from sort of here to Maffeo, and then from, from Wentworth, down Wentworth, essentially. Sorry, there Wentworth. is this segment on Comox yeah. that is envisioned to be part of the downtown cycle loop, but it's not part of this particular project. It's, it's, in a, it's a year or two further up the plan. So that is, just as a cyclist, that is the most dangerous section of that whole loop. So infrastructure-wise, it might, you know, if we're really trying to get people on their bikes, that might be the, the section of the loop that we should focus on. Because that's, people, I find people are really quite comfortable-ish riding front and past Maffeo, but getting from Maffeo to, to sorry, I think it's Wallace, Wallace. Said Wentworth. Wallace. Um, that, because you're, you're crossing the highway and then you're crossing two lanes and people are trying to get left to go onto Wallace. Um, I'm just flagging it, it's a really tricky section for cyclists. Yeah, st staff wrestle with these questions or dilemmas sort of all the time. We have the, an opportunity for creating maybe an easy installation, a cheap installation. We call it low-hanging fruit. So like a road that has enough weight potentially that you can just build this stuff versus the locations where there's the highest value. They don't always align. Yeah. So we have to kind of do our best to, to juggle that and, and come up with what we come up with. So <laughs> it's a bit of a judgment call sometimes. <clears throat> Albert and Fourth is another one. So this would be an important link between downtown and VIU because we have the bike lane on 4th Street. So this would provide a connection from downtown 
through that uh, sort of S curve that leads down to the cat stream there, and it would be uh, uh, buffered bike lane on both sides of the road. There'd be some impact to parking. We've studied that, and we believe there's there would be enough remaining capacity for parking, but people may have to walk across the street to access an available parking space. So it'd be a little bit of an impact to some. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Wellcock secondary access. I think I think you've heard this a number of times. We've put it in the plan for 2023, which is sort of far enough out that it gives us a bit of time to sort of organize it. Um, the important piece is that we need to have a secondary access. Right now, the trestle is is there. It's uh, you know we're inspecting it twice a year and we're monitoring it very closely. At some point, it's going to get to the point where we it really doesn't make sense to continue to maintain it. Um, but until that time comes, this isn't. This isn't quite as urgent. Any questions on this? Okay, moving on. Uh, terminal trench. So, the area between, on terminal, between commercial and Comox, there's a number of utilities there. Uh, it's obviously a Ministry of Transportation facility. So there's a number of uh, storm sewers, um, sanitary sewers. We've already replaced the water now, because we had to go, we had to accelerate that. There's a number of utilities that need to be replaced. And Ministry of Transportation needs to repave the road because it's in pretty tough shape, although they did some substantial patching a few years ago. So as, as part of this project, we will incorporate pieces of scope from the Terminal Nickel Reimagined as best we can incorporate them into whatever upgrades we're planning there. So it'll, it'll, it's anticipated to be a substantial project, um, but we don't have details on the scope at this point. <coughs> Any questions? Yes, I'm sure. Mr. Your Worship, um, so the question I have back in, I, mean, I guess it was the early to mid 90s, there were significant upgrades to something along there because I know the street was cut down substantially for at least two months. Um, and I don't know whether that was storm sewer or, or just what it was, but I only got a whole lot of, lot of trenches and a bunch of pipe. Um, and then two years ago, um, they did the so we had we had we had anticipated all these problems as as before that, but we had a couple of fairly substantial water main breaks uh, on that corridor that really required us to accelerate the water component on its own, uh, and so that's that's why the the water went went earlier. Than the so the, in the 90s, the materials and the pipes that were in at that time would be replaced now. Uh, so in this particular stretch, I don't think the infrastructure that we're talking about replacing was what was put in in the 90s. Generally, the, the, the infrastructure that we're replacing is quite often the stuff that was put in like the 60s, maybe the 70s, and, and sort of earlier, yeah, especially sewers. Sewers tend to last quite a long time, so it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be the, the 1990s sewers that we're, we're tackling right now. I, I, know, I don't know the exact details of where that 1990s project was, well, but it was only... Uh, street lights, okay, so street lights are generally included in major transportation projects. So if we just do a sidewalk on a, maybe a smaller street, it may or may not be included. One of the things that we have in the plan for 2020 is uh, essentially the completion of the downtown um, replacement of those older globe or sort of little box lights that we have. And there's a number of locations where those exist. There's a little spot on Terminal, Wharf, Church, and then Front Street near the sort of cenotaph, there's uh, an area there that has some, essentially it's the, the remainder, and they'll all be uh, converted to those sort of current standard, they're called the heritage lights, the ones that you see along commercial and, and so on. Um, and then we have the LED street light conversion. Um, we've, we've done phase one last year. We're in the process of doing phase two this year. We had originally envisioned phase three would be the rest of the city, which would be a substantial amount of work, a lot of the residential areas. So what staff are proposing here is to actually spread that out over four years. Makes it a little bit more manageable for staff as well as it makes it a little bit more affordable as well. Now one thing that we actually don't have in the plan is funding specifically to deal with dark spots. So we have lots of roads around and trails around the city that have, unfortunately they have dark spots just the way they were developed through the improvement districts and through time. They just don't have that infrastructure. So we don't have funding to deal specifically to target dark spots, just for awareness. 
this is not the most pretty slide, but it's one I just wanted to show you, just as a reminder from when we talked to you in the, I think it was in the spring, around the, the transportation workshop that we had. We talked a little bit about sort of what we have built over the past five years and what is in the plan for the next five years. So it's really just to show you the amount of work going forward is anticipated to be an awful lot more than what was, what was actually built in the previous five years. And that ties into this slide here, which talks about you know, we have $67 million planned for transportation work in the next five years. And from a pedestrian cycling standpoint, from where we were in the spring, this plan has got 30% more. And to be honest, a lot of that is in Metro. Metro is a large project, a large expensive project. So that's one of the reasons why that's, that's up. And uh, <clears throat> a substantial amount in renewal, which most of that 24 million is road rehab, as Ms. Fuller explained earlier, I think it was around 15 million. And the remainder would be renewal of things like street lights and, and, and poles and things like that. So Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, bit of a crazy question, but I know we have a lot of our budget going to road rehab. Lived on the East Coast for a long time. Potholes are kind of part of life. Is there any, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Could we, could we not do road rehab for a, a wee while and put money into other projects, recognizing that that, in the long run, might, you know, it'll cost more to rehab, et cetera, et cetera, but as we're trying to really prioritize different, different things, is there an opportunity to press pause on some of our rehab projects? So one of the challenges there is the road rehab projects are quite often bundled or concurrent with our other projects. So if we have a road that's the asphalt's at end of life, and maybe we're doing the water and the sewer, and maybe we're building sidewalks, like road rehab may have some funding that it contributes to that project because the asphalt's at end of life. So if we withdraw that piece of the funding, the project might end up collapsing. So that's that's not all of the road rehab money, but that's a large portion of it is in those it's tied up in those types of things. We also have some road rehab money that's specifically meant to target the sort of the worst road, not necessarily the worst road, but the road in most need. And that, and that, when we talked to you in the spring around road rehab, remember I had those slides with the, the curve showing asset deterioration and that mm -hmm. sort of break point where if you kind of go past that, then you have to rebuild the whole road. I don't know if you remember those slides, but we talked about the amount of money we have in the road rehab program. It's about three million a year. To sustain our current level of service, we need to have at least five million. So we're already running a deficit and we're already allocating most of that three million with these concurrent projects. So we're really, really far behind already. Having said that, uh, if council wishes us not to um, allocate any funds to, to road rehab for a period of time, we can certainly explore that, but there are sort of long-term asset management implications that uh, would be I guess, adverse. Okay. Thank you. Sidewalks. Now, I want to show you a cool GIS. So I have a cool GIS application that I want to show you because you know we were talking about GIS earlier, and we know sidewalks have been very topical for the past while. Uh, I'm sort of thinking a while ago. I've been with the city for about 10 years, and we've always had this interest in sidewalks from the public, and it's always kind of been steady state. It's always kind of been there. In the past year, it's kind of gone through the roof, and then in the past couple of months, it's just gone astronomical. <laughs> so I've been trying to think, why on earth is this happening? And maybe it has something to do with uh, the climate crisis, maybe everyone's out there trying to do their part and they're not happy with what they have available. So, uh, we do have quite a bit of funding in the plan to, to deal with sidewalks. And, and one thing to keep in mind is, as part of all our major transportation projects, you know, we follow a complete streets principle where we're going to have facilities for cyclists, for pedestrians, for transit. We're thinking about all that. So even though we have a major, major road project going on, like the Boxwood Connector, it's not just for cars. It's providing pedestrian connectivity. It's providing cycling infrastructure. So it's really the full gamut there. Now, we did talk earlier a little bit about the 300,000 <coughs> council has available at their discretion for pedestrian facilities. One thing I'd just add to that is these kinds of projects, they're they're, they're difficult to, to get ready in a year. Quite often the, the, sort of the construction season is usually kind of summer, can lead into the fall. As it gets too cold, you can't pave anymore. The Asheville plant shuts down. And that's quite often one of the last things you need to do in a project is, is pave. And the design process can take 
depending on how complex the project, if there's utility relocations, there's a lot. Anyway, my point is, if council identifies a particular project, say in January or February, it could be extremely difficult or impossible to get it built in the same year. So that's just a heads up on that $300,000. I'm going to shift over to this GIS application. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So what, so what you're looking at here, this is a purpose-built GIS application that our GIS team and Mark Milby sitting in the back there together pretty quickly. It was built for the purposes of this presentation. And what it is, it's showing in pink all the existing sidewalks the city has. Now what you're seeing in yellow are all the existing cycling facilities, so dedicated cycling facilities. So when we have like a shared lane, like Bone Road's a shared lane, that wouldn't or shouldn't show up on here as a cycling facility. So it has to be dedicated specifically to sidewalk. And then the green, those are all multi-use trails. So this is showing all the city's existing sort of active transportation infrastructure. And we can, uh, we can uh, what we also have on here is we can show you all what's planned in the next sort of five years as part of this budget what's included here. So I'm going to turn that on so you can see what, what's coming down the pipeline. And they'll show up in blue. So you can see this is, this is Metro. This is the box of connector, the box of road, and then this connection down through here that we talked about. This is Stewart Avenue, downtown cycling lane, site, uh, 10th Street, Albert Ford Bikeway. So you can see this is what's in basically five years of the plan. To be honest, it looks a little bit meager. But keep in mind, you know, we have about 520 kilometers of roads. If notionally every road should have a sidewalk on both sides, we only have about 440 kilometers of sidewalk. So our sidewalk deficiency can be thought of as around 600 kilometers, which is actually more than we actually have sidewalk. Now, sidewalks are cheap. You know, quite often when you're building a sidewalk, you have to put in a storm sewer to... Because when you add the curbs, you have to collect the storm sewer. So, sidewalk generally, when we're, when we're looking at it, it can be between $1,000 and $2,000 a meter. And then the storm infrastructure can be about another seven or $800 a meter. So you're looking at about between $1 and $2 million a kilometer. So if you do the math on that, if we're 600 kilometers deficient, and it's about a million dollars a kilometer, a million dollars a kilometer, you're looking at between half a billion and a billion dollars in sidewalk emissions. So you can see why we have such a challenge meeting, you know, meeting the demand of the, of the, of the community to, to build enough sidewalk and cycling infrastructure for them. So I thought we can zoom in on a particular area if council wishes and talk a little bit more about a particular spot or we can, we can move on. Mr. Gessler. Um, thank you, Worship. Through you, uh, Ms. Rosen. Uh, I've got a question just on terms of putting sidewalk in. Um, is it possible to just put like a curb in some areas that you know, allows water to be able to like go off the road and through the curb and off uh, without having to build that raised concrete and that? So like there's separation, uh, but without sort of the additional costs of that added concrete from that. I mean, is that is that a practice that happens, or? There, there are some areas around the city where that has mm -hmm. been done. I've seen areas, I know on Hammond Bay Road, and, and I'm sure I'm sure Jamie can identify probably a couple dozen yeah. spots where that, that's in place. It's generally not considered best practice. Mm -hmm. um, Does it reduce costs? Significantly cheaper. Well, yeah. the, the one thing that we do also like to do during snowfalls is peel those off. Mm -hmm. So which means we can do about it. Right. right. Yeah. The cost comes later. Right. <laughs> we have to do all that shoveling by hand that works responsibly. It's responsibility of the joining property owners to do it, do it safely. Councillor Hammond. Thank you. So I do have a specific section that I'm interested yeah. in, um, and forgive me for the time, but um, the 700 block of Halliburton, we currently have sidewalks 
up to it, and then a block away, we're putting in the new Halliburton multi-use path. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious, did we contemplate um, finishing that section? Um, and if, if we, if obviously we didn't choose to, so why? Was it cost? It's, it's one block connecting a huge yeah. piece of infrastructure. Um, so what was the rationale there for not, for not doing that extra block? That's an interesting question. I, I actually don't know the history of that one. I've, I've looked at it, um, and it looks like it's a good candidate for, for sidewalk. Um, now, as part of the waterfront walkway future phases, it is included in that. And you can see I just turned it on for, it's in 2025 that we currently have it in the plan for. Um, and that would be like a multi-use trail type of facility probably. Conceivably, it could be fast-tracked. It could be something that council might want to allocate the, the $300,000 to advancing that. That's a possibility, um, and we would look to council for 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 their for their priorities for that funding. I'm going to go to Ms. Gurry for a minute. I was noting the time here very carefully. Yes, thank you, Worship. So this meeting um, is taking significantly longer than I think was planned. So it is scheduled only until noon. So you do have a couple options. Um, we. Um, at a staff level, have discussed having an additional um, special finance and audit meeting in November um, to deal with finance and audit related matters because it's going to be taken up, um, a lot of your meeting time will be taken up with budget in November. So today you could um, deal with the remaining items on the agenda outside of this presentation and we can carry on with the presentation on the 12th. Um, and or um, you could just deal with the matters that absolutely need dealing with today, which I know for one is um, Ms. Fry needs her, um, her matter dealt with, and I'm not sure if staff want to jump in on the other items that are on your agenda. Or you could extend this meeting for another hour if you choose and deal with as much as you could. Councilor Gaspar. I think we can fire through the uh, rest of the, the reports and make decisions on that relatively quickly, and then we can ensure we can do the rest of the presentation. Um, we have a fair bit to go, obviously, in terms of projects, our presentation goals, we're not going to get there yet. So this think, is a substantial Yeah, thing. I think possibly the projects should be put off to the next date, right. the November 12th date. And you can either deal with the remaining items or deal with as many as you can. But if you could deal with D, um, that would be appreciated. So. Unless, um, Mr. Rose, can you just vote, finished your... Worship, I only have a few slides left. I could go through them fairly quickly if you want, and then that would be a good break. Well, let's extend this for a few minutes. We'll do your slides, and then we'll get to item B, 7 B. Thank you. Appreciate your indulgence. Well, C. I'd rather allocate the business session. We had our in camera counsel for Monday. Could we not put it back on and do the rest of this then? Just come in Monday? No, not as in camera, but deal with it then. I'm Have a finance and audit continuation. Yeah. I, I suggest after Mr. Rosen quickly goes through his next couple yes. slides, then we can and then discuss. Have a discussion, let's please. Oh, Mr. Rosen. I'll, I'll power through the next couple of slides here. So the cycling infrastructure was similar. I was going to show you the map of that GIS map and so on. Um, they're all part of major projects. So notable changes. I've gone through most of these. I won't reiterate them. But if you're interested, you can, you can ask me any questions about that. Projects that are not in the plan. So these are some important things. So the public works facility renewal. We know it's at end of life. It's got capacity issues. It's got uh, seismic risk, risk issues. It, there's no funding for that in, in the plan. Um, we don't have a significant increase to uh, asphalt road rehab. We talked about that. It's not at the level that we need to be at for asset management purposes. We talked about no uh, funding for street light infill to fill in those dark spots. And then the Greenway extension, that's not in plan currently. Now, that was it for my presentation. Um, no, sir. I do have a question. I know, but I, I feel like it's a very important question. question. <laughs> so on your sidewalk slide, you have 1.8 million in 2020. According to your previous 
estimate, we have one to two million a kilometer for sidewalks. That's how much it costs. So are we, we're, we're saying it costs us between one and two million dollars to create new sidewalk. And for 2020, we have budgeted 1.8 million. So presumably we're getting a kilometer to two of new sidewalks. Yeah, it would it'd be very specific to the project. Like projects can range quite substantially. Like when I first started with the city, we were putting sidewalks in for about $300 a meter, sort of like the low-hanging fruit was still available. You know, as we start looking at things like Hammond Bay Road, for example, even even the cost of that would be off by a factor of four, probably. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the project. So if, 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 if you wanted to look at it at that sort of level of detail, it would probably have to break it down on a project-specific basis. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we deal then with item 7D? Thank you. Uh, so I apologize, uh, Your Worship, and Council uh, for rushing ahead with this, but in order to have this grant, it needs to be uh, approved through a resolution through Council by the end of the month. So this is one of our good news stories and talking about uh, obtaining grants uh, to help protect our environment. So it is through UBCM, through the um, community called Community Resiliency Investment Program. And because the city of Nanaimo is considered a low risk uh, through the province for wildfire, uh, it has been identified as part of our high, uh, high risk hazard risk and vulnerability analysis. We're applying up to $25,000 for various projects uh, to be completed in 2020. Um, and some of those projects include uh, Fire Smart. Um, applications on Protection Island, um, a partnership with Vancouver Island University, one on uh, the Long Lake area in town in that community. It is considered one of our higher risks through our uh, community wildfire protection plan. So this is simply a, a, a request for a resolution uh, through, through this committee to apply for up to $25,000 or to apply for a $25,000 grant at no cost to the city. Excellent. Councillor Larkin and then Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to move the motion. Second. And we heard about this at UBCM and, yeah, and so <laughs> I'm so any happy. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favour? Opposed motion carries. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, Your Worship, and if you could just indulge staff, um, if you could do 7C, I don't think there should be a lot of discussion no, on that one. And then it's just a mess. Let's move it. So moved second. by Councillor Martin, second by Councillor Armstrong. Discussion, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. I do have discussion on this, and it's uh, through you to staff, uh, because I think anytime there is a uh, heritage uh, facade grant and it's uh, an operating business, uh, I think we have to be very careful that all of the guidelines have been met and I just want assurance that this project does meet all of the criteria and it has been vetted to your satisfaction. I'm looking, sorry, I'm looking at uh, <laughs> Mr. Schulber, Mr. Schulber. <clears throat> yes, Councillor oh, Thorpe through the mayor, yes. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. I'm going to assume that we will want some discussion on 7B if I'm wrong. Give me an indication um, yes. now. Your, your Worship, um, I've been told it's going to take about a good hour to get through that. Yes. Um, so that could be a good candidate to carry forward to the 12th as well as the remaining of the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if it's, is, it, is it possible, as, as, as it's suggested, um, I, I, I appreciate it's election day on the 21st, but quite can't we were scheduled for the camera meeting. Is there any technical reason we can't? No, so Your Worship, we have, we have cancelled that in camera, um, which means that we're just starting our open meeting later. We could have a special finance and audit that begins at... Um, even five that day to get through a couple hours of remaining items if 
your staff could move it along <laughs> that day and make it. We have to have Councilor it. Bonner, uh, I, I'd be fine with that, and we might as well have that the VICC so we don't have to keep running around. Yes. Yes. Mr. Sure. Rudolph, any concerns? Sure. Uh, just maybe to be safe, we could do it at 4 30. Yeah. Just yeah. to be safe, four three. Three. For the mayor, it's not a very heavy agenda that evening in any event. As much as I love watching election returns, as everybody else does, I'm sure that it's more important to get on with this. All right. Um, we know what's left. Any <laughs> no questions? A motion for adjournment who will reconvene so at 4.30 on October the 21st. We'll just have some new meetings. Yes. Yeah.